All right, Amy, why don't you just start with who you are, Mm -hmm. why you're here, why we met, and we'll start there. Okay. Uh, My name is Amy Zalnaritis, and I am the co-founder and chief brand officer of We Feed Raw, which is a direct-to-consumer raw meal plan service for dogs. So we deliver uh, complete and balanced custom meal plans to dogs all over the country. And I'm here because... You feed your dogs, our dog, I should say, soon to be. You'll be feeding, hopefully, yeah. the other one, too. I actually did start. I oh, good. Oh, good. Awesome. I did start him. <laughs> Sooner he was better. very excited. Oh, awesome. He's been eating Purina puppy chow <laughs> for four weeks. Yeah. I gave him a little bit of wee feed raw. Yeah. He was fired up. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. That's so good to hear. Usually that does. It's but The sooner you can start him on raw, the better. As soon as they're eating solids. I think as soon as you, like, so for those of you who are listening, watching, that don't maybe know, I got a new puppy. His name is Burley. He's a borble. I haven't had a puppy in eight years. Not to cut you off. (laughs) No. But I want to talk about (laughs) really quick, like, talking about the sooner the better. The amount of people that were in the, all the posts I did on my puppy were so great. But what surprised me a little bit is people were like, I didn't know you, sh- you could start training this early. Mm-hmm. I didn't know you can put your dog in a crate this early. I didn't know you can start raw food this early. So anyway. No, it's true. We get that all the time. It's like even people that have fed, or, you know, are feeding their other older dogs raw food and then they get a puppy. They're like, so they already believe in the benefits of raw, right? And then they get a puppy and they're like, do I have to wait? <laughs> like, But wait for what? To feed them ultra processed food first? Like, no, feed them the fresh stuff as soon as you can. So we always say as soon as they're weaned from mother's milk and they're eating solids, you can start on the raw food. Cool. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get off in that puppy tangent in a little bit, but <laughs> sorry to interrupt you yeah. so quickly into the podcast. <laughs> so, all right. So, um, yeah, so We Feed Raw is the company that you – took over. Yeah. Um, can you kind of explain the whole scenario of how you became involved with We Feed Raw in its earlier stages? Yeah, the origin story is pretty uh, unique, I guess. Um, so my younger sister, Alyssa, started uh, the company. It was called something different. It was kind of, it definitely looked a lot different than it does today, but she was the original founder of this business and she started in I think she's this was 2009 was actually the beginning of this company um she was a big dog lover she always loved dogs we grew up with dogs around all the time our parents were big rescuers of animals so we sort of were just always exposed to that Mm. um and she grew up to be a big rescuer of dogs herself and around 2007 there was a a widespread, widespread recalls of pet food. I don't know if you remember this, but it was in connection with uh, contaminated wheat gluten. So a bunch of pet food. I was food. in high school then, so. <laughs> so you were doing other things. I was probably, <laughs> yeah, like playing yeah. Frisbee or something. Yeah. Well, anyways, the uh, what had happened was there was a manufacturer, a Chinese manufacturer that was selling the meat glu- wheat gluten and had purposefully added melamine, which is an industrial chemical, to the wheat gluten to boost the protein content, which are, there should be no melamine in any food for dogs or humans or anyone, um, and then sold it to pet food manufacturers. It ended up in the pet food supply and killed and made sick thousands and thousands of dogs and cats. Killed. Yeah. They still, to this day, don't know like the extent uh, but it was really bad and it made headlines and it sort of like really started to get people to think the pet owning community to think more critically about what they were feeding their dogs. Sure. And, um, my sister was sort of part of that thinking and that mind shift. So she's discovered dog. Did your dogs get sick? No, but it was just such a, it was really, I mean, people were at that point, you know, there were some people that were feeding healthier alternatives to, kibble, but most people know, like that was just sort of what you feed or canned or kibble, right? So there was definitely this mind shift. um, And I think it really sort of, you you can look back and see that there was, that changed things and and raw feeding and healthier alternatives to kibble really grew at that point. Um, So she discovered raw feeding. She started making her own dogs, her own rescues, raw meals, and she became an expert at making them. And so she immediately saw the difference, too, as soon as she switched them. Mm -hmm. And then she started making uh, raw meals for her friends' dogs and then friends' friends dogs, and the business just grew organically from there. And um, she and her fiancé, Rich Real, um, 
they had this business together. He kind of like, I say she was the brains and he was the brawn. Like she mm. was the business side and he took over like making all of the meals. He had been a chef, so he was really good at that mm, side of it. Perfect. Yeah. And so they delivered, they were in Austin, Texas. They delivered uh, fresh raw meals door to door to their Austin clients. And they had a really nice business for, um, you know, a few years, uh, profitable, going well, not like growing super fast, but this was, you know, enough to have it be their full-time jobs. Yeah. So um, around 2013, um, she, like out of the blue, it felt like, was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Mm. So at that point, it was obviously devastating for my entire family um, and my sister, obviously, and we were all living on the East Coast, so we um, all wanted to be closer to her. So she moved with Rich and all the dogs to Maine, where my dad was living. I was in New York City, my mom was in Massachusetts, and we kind of all rallied together to, you know, support her and help support the business in any way we could. And she ended up uh, dying uh, at the end of 2014, December 23rd of December, uh, December 23rd of 2014. Um, so at that point, as devastated and grief stricken as we all were, um, we kind of knew that we couldn't let this business die. And it wasn't one of those things where you could just say like, oh, in a couple of months we'll decide. Like it was like, mm. you either had to keep this going. Like it wasn't that type of business. It was so hands-on. There was meat getting delivered to the facility. There were like a bunch of production workers. It was just like not the type of thing where you could pause and come back to it. So wow. whether that was part of our grief, grieving process and like it being cathartic to actually focus on this because it was an extension of her. I mean, she worked on this business up until the last week of her life. She, you know, she was in a lot of suffering and pain and she still worked on this business. It really was so much to her. So um, my dad came out of retirement. He took over sort of the operations. Her fiance Rich went back to running the production team. Um, I had a full-time job in New York City, but made this my second job. So I worked on securing outside funding, um, growing the customer base turning it into a brand too. So I have a background in marketing. I worked with a creative agency to create We Feed Raw. So it wasn't We Feed Raw before, it was named something else. It didn't really have a brand. It was always like up until that point, a supplier of Raw. So it wasn't really a brand, right? It didn't, it, it was this amazing, great product, but we weren't showcasing that through the brand. So I do think that was a huge turning point for the company to actually develop this really cool brand that had, you know, with the colors and the fonts and the voice and the tone and who are we? Um, there's so much crappy pet food branding out there that I thought it really was um, something that helped us stand out. So, yeah, that's kind of like what we did. And it's grown and grown and grown. And, you know, it became my full time job, I think, about five years ago. Um, mm. And we've it's grown tremendously and now have a much bigger team and um it's it's really been cool to to be a part of and to know that something my sister started uh has become you know this really sort of amazing company that's feeding so many dogs than she ever could have imagined so so you guys passed on that torch yeah that's special yeah it really is it's cool it I is mean, yeah 100 percent it's been a lot of hard work. It's not an easy business. There's nothing easy about what we do. Um, you know, we're shipping raw frozen meat around the country. Uh, you can imagine all the things yeah. that can go wrong. Um, but we're in a really good place. And I think we've sort of cracked the code in a lot of ways on like how to do that, like with our distribution centers around the country. It allows us to get food to customers in like one to two days. Um, most, 98% uh, of our shipments are ground, so we don't, we're not spending this crazy amount of money on express shipping, which we were for a while. Sure. So um, we're really, really in a good place, um, but still every day is, you know, hard sure. when yeah. you have a business. So. Well, I'll say that uh, I'm impressed by that, and I'm proud of you guys for doing that. Thank you. Even though I don't know you guys you. as well as, you know, maybe some of your friends and family, but working with you guys for the last in what four months six months however it's been I'm really bad with time but I think it's been like almost has it been almost a year I'm bad with time too so maybe we'll just say it like could been, eight months it could be six months to a year yeah. it could be a year and a half for yeah. all I know but all I know is is you know whenever I work with any type of company like we get approached all the time by as any other person would right and I only work with people that a 
I do. So it's like I feed raw, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a easy, you know, and that's why we, this makes sense. But my point is, is I'm proud to be part of what you guys are doing because it's a special thing that you and your family uh, went through. And it was probably really still to this day hurts. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you guys like push through it and had this silver lining of like, we're going to keep her mission going is pretty special because when something like that happens, it's, it's kind of like it's done and, and you kind of look back on things, but you guys just kind of extended her mission, you know, which mm -hmm. is really special. And to some degree too, selfishly, I'll say that that's similar to, what I have done in my career, mm -hmm. where my my Saint Bernard uh, Saint, uh, my first Saint Bernard that I got kicked out of my house for and kind of started this mm -hmm. whole thing was he died from a heart attack, cardiac arrest when he was like seven. It was this big traumatic thing. He died in my lap, had a heart attack in front of a family. It was bad, right? And at the time, I was like, why does this happen? Like. Mm -hmm. This is terrible. Not to the degree of your sister passing, but at 19, 20 years old, devoting my whole life to this puppy and trying to live on my own and, you know. Yeah. It, it was, like, devastating. And the silver lining was, for me, is it found me to dogs. I said I never, after he passed, because I worked so many hours to support him, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to become like a dog walker. I wanted to go take care of other people's dogs because I felt bad. It was almost like in his memory. Mm -hmm. So very similar to some degree on some avenue of like the silver lining of something that tragically happened to us has pushed us in a direction where it's changed our lives. Yeah. And I think also starting from a place of, um, you know, heart and not necessarily like this wasn't did this company. Right. Um, the business opportunity presented itself after she was already doing it because she was, you know, concerned about the well-being of dogs. And it was sort of like, oh, there's a business here, but exactly. not like an entrepreneurial pursuit yes. from the beginning. Yeah. Those are with the, it's in my experience, listening to other people who have started companies big and small, those are the best companies, the bootstrap mm -hmm. type bring up where you <clears throat> find this void or this thing in your life where you're like, even like mud water, for an example, that I drink, the guy was like, he's upset with coffee. And like, that was his yeah. whole mantra is he's yeah. like, I didn't want to start a, 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 a beverage company. He's like, I just had this thing missing in my life right. and I was pissed off about it. And then right. he created this or like, right. you know, there's plenty, plenty of things probably even around yeah. this room that yeah. we could say yeah. there was something missing and then something great cr was created out of it. So that's gotta be hard, but now you're here and yeah. I mean, it's definitely, it's rewarding and, um, again, cathartic to have had this survive. Um, I, I always say like mm. there was a period when my sister from, from when she was diagnosed to her dying, you know, there was a lot of, um, whether or not, you know, this was realistic, we tried to save her. We were trying all different things with her. She was trying different things. Like she had done chemo that wasn't working. We were trying all the, you know, sort of, more out there yeah. uh, methods and we were grasping um, onto any of those things and it just felt like we were you know for like a year and a half trying fighting so hard for her survival and then when she did it when she did die you know we couldn't save her but we could save her company so there's a lot of um, sort of healing in that you know yeah. like we put we poured that <laughs> into the company and it still to this day very much feels like an extension of her you know, so the, for me as her sister, um, that feels nice. You mm -hmm. know, it's a connection. It's like an ongoing living connection I have to her. Mm -hmm. It has to be. It's mm -hmm. a, that's what I mean is it's this beautiful thing that you know, the unfortunate thing happened, which, you know, it's it, it's a greater probably thing than, than what we know. And mm -hmm. the fact that you took what her passion was and then and kind of what you were doing, too. It's not like you didn't have a have skin in the game of like what to do. You didn't, you're like, Hey, I do marketing mm -hmm. so I can do this. I know mm -hmm. the, the, the proper things on how to get things going. When you started the, when you reached out to, cause it takes, I'll just say from a business standpoint, what you guys are doing at scale is, is hard, like very, very hard. I don't think 
the average person would understand how much it takes to even find packaging, yeah, even find logistics, mm-hmm. even find the dry ice, even find like what you guys do have so many moving parts mm-hmm. and to be able to put it all together and then ship it to somebody's door it's not what people think where they're like, oh, we're going to go find a farm. We're mm-hmm. going to get this stuff. We're going to put it in a bag. We're going to seal it, ship it. It's mm-hmm. like there's so much that goes on. Mm-hmm. And that's just the operational side. Mm-hmm. That's not the legal side. Mm-hmm. That's not the marketing side. Mm-hmm. That's not the customer service. That's not the website. That's mm-hmm. not the SEO. That's not any of that, which is all big pillars in a mm-hmm. business. So what you guys are doing, considering you weren't, uh, somebody who was like, hey, I'm really good at logistics and I've sold five other companies on direct-to-consumer. We're going to, mm, yeah, dogs, that sounds good. Like you just yeah. fell into it and built it out, mm-hmm. which is very impressive. Yeah, we found the right people to help too, right? Because <laughs> That's what I was going to ask. How did yeah. you, when you said you found like a creative um, agency, yeah, agency to, so w- I'm interested in what that process is because mm-hmm. – I am. I love branding and marketing myself. I think it's like so interesting to see how yeah. people react to yeah. what you do. Yeah. So how 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 would how did that? Did you bring them like, hey, this is my sister's company. This is what it's called, and we we need to scale this. Yeah. So um, it was me and one of our angel investors at the time, uh, Andy. We we interviewed a bunch of different creative agencies, like all over New York, and. <laughs> Just explain, you know, just getting pitched and, um, you know, a lot of great ones, but there's one in Austin, Texas, funny enough, uh, that really sort of we clicked with. And I have, I mean, I love saying their name because they did such a great job, but they're called Preacher. Um, and they just got it. They got what we were trying to do. They they loved the whole, you know, mission. They they, they loved it. So, yeah, they... they we, basically, you know, interviewed a bunch of our like top customers. They just got in there and it was a long process. I mean, probably like six to eight months of, wow. um, you know, working together. What's that like? What did they ask you? Like, oh, you- I mean, for me, it was fun because that's what I love to do. So, you know, we came up with everything from, again, the name. Uh, we had all different names. We, you know, um, like the colors, the what's the feel? I mean, we have, and I will say th- what it looked like after they were first finished We've iterated on it since then. It's still very much the core uh, brand, but like I'll say, so we were still based in Maine when when we were doing this. Um, we were producing ourselves in Maine. We were shipping from Maine. It was kind of like a Maine company. And Maine has great connotations, right? It's fresh. It's like it's like Poland Springs from Maine, Tom's from Maine, like all of these brands. Um, so it was very much like natural out in nature. Um, you know, I remember like a lot of the images were like sort of a hunter in his welly boots with his like hunting dog next to him. And that was great. And we sort of launched with that, but. Is it L.O. Bean in Maine too? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That's I think the vibe. Freeport. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. the vibe for sure. Um, and we were very much a Maine company, but I think um, as we've grown, I mean, a lot of our customers are in New York city or LA or, you know, they live in apartments. Like we really wanted to, over the years, we've learned that like we need to soften that image because it was also back then to a little bit more like it's all raw or nothing. Like this is the best way to feed your dog. If you feed anything else. Sometimes like, that's how I am though. Yeah, I know, but you can't really, you know, it's not really the best way to grow and it's not really fair to a lot of yeah. the pet parents out there. So we've sort of softened that image and um, made it, it's still, you know, there's a part of that. So it's like, you know, maybe the person who has the dog who might live in the city but goes to nature on the weekends or, you know, it's sort of like the shapes on, we used to have like much more hard edges or a little bit more soft and organic shapes now. Um, so we still have that image, but it's just been softened over the years. So, And what that means, I would say, mm-hmm. for people listening, because one thing that I think you bring to the table outside of a dog lover slash entrepreneur, marketer, is the idea that when you say these things, I think people can really take a lot away from the conversation of how you took a company that was getting shipped from, you know, your dad's place in Maine to a a national company. You're talking about like, when you say shapes, you're talking about everything from packaging to fonts, to colorations, to like those are so every granule thing when you're talking about branding you're talking about like you said mood boards right so you're looking at you're looking at it's interesting when people hear this conversation they're like why would you have 
I'm just envisioning like a company coming. Reacher, you said? Preacher. Preacher. Yeah. Preacher. Preach the good. Preacher is yeah. the show. Yeah. <laughs> Preacher comes and they're like, all right, this is the vibe. It's like they have all these different pictures for you guys, like a mood board of like, mm-hmm. this is what we want people to feel. Mm-hmm. This is what it, what we want maybe them to smell when they like see this picture, if yeah. you will. So those are the things that you guys did. And then you kind of went for the more scalable Mm -hmm. we want everybody we want this to be approachable by every dog lover yeah well over the years we've evolved we sort of learned that maybe like that's not the and and raw feeding has evolved even in you know since i've been doing it it's like it is much more mainstream it's not mainstream it's more mainstream than it's been right so definitely it is like we need to appeal to the person that maybe they feed raw as a topper or they just mix the raw with their kibble or they just want to feed raw meals a few times a week like we want to be a resource for people to just get more raw into their dog's bowls and it doesn't have to be raw for every meal obviously we think that's the best but what are the other ways we can talk to people that maybe can't afford to feed raw for every meal or they have like multiple big dogs in the home and it's just not feasible. Mm -hmm. Um, It's sort of like, uh, again, not raw, all raw or nothing. It's like whatever fits for your budget and lifestyle, we want to support that too. So I think before when it was first, we first launched the new brand, it was a little bit more hardcore, you know? Um, And we still are hardcore in some ways. Like I don't want to lose that. I think like we... Uh, my husband always says, who was the COO for a while, like, we're a little rock and roll, you know, like, we're kind of like the rebels, you know, this isn't we, if you feed this way, you have to be willing to go against the status quo, right? You have to be willing to think a little differently, because your vet might be telling you not to do this, like a lot of 95% of dogs are fed kibble. So this is different. This is a different way to feed. So we have to kind of own that too. I love that. Yeah. I In my experience, it seems that with my so the people my clients my circle in raw food is always a conversation so it's interesting that 90 yeah sure we can say 95 90 percent of people feel kibble yeah. but the people who are interested in really bettering their relationship with their dog mm-hmm. so my clients mm-hmm. uh my you know my online platform my community the no bad dog army everyone's aware of the raw food and majority of those people mm-hmm. are actually like i either feed raw mm-hmm. or I understand that it's beneficial. I can't really afford it. Or maybe I do it part time. Mm -hmm. Like Abby used to do it part time. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that you say that because from a marketing standpoint and from a brand standpoint Mm -hmm. and building a community standpoint, there's different communities that the status quo would be raw food. Yeah. That's a good point. Because I actually see more people feeding raw in my community and in my circles Mm -hmm than kibble Mm -hmm. because these are the type of people that are doing the research on what's good for my dog. I want to listen. I want to watch somebody train a dog that yields results. That is, is, is a dog trainer and not. So my point is, is there's different groups that will say, yeah, I would say 90% of the general population. Sure. Mm -hmm. But the people who are really Mm -hmm. into bettering their relationship with their dog, Mm -hmm. understanding their dog Mm -hmm. and, and in, and in our case, like nutritional yeah. stuff, that's why our partnership works so well is because a lot of the people who follow me on whatever platform are curious and hungry for a better way, a different yeah. way, mm-hmm. an alternative. Mm-hmm. And it's really fascinating to see those different cultures live. And that's that's why I think politics exist in every industry. Yeah. It's because people are passionate about what they are. Yeah. And I've even seen this yesterday. We had a client come in, can't remember where, but she was like, she was a nutritionist. She was younger in shape. And Mm -hmm. she said, I work from home. I'm a nutritionist. Her husband worked from home as well, both just young in shape people. And she said, yeah, you know, I talk a lot about nutrition, giving people diet plans, specifically with women, uh, you know, going through pregnancies and different things. Like it takes a specific uh, nutrition and diet and observation of that. And then I started, so my... I talked to this in my last podcast. My intro to wellness and nutrition has has recently begun. My wife's super healthy, like runs two or three times a day, it seems. And she's like, <laughs> day, wow. yeah, not really, but she, <laughs> she kicks my ass and everything. So she's, she's just really healthy and she's kind of got me into this too because I started leaning into what she was doing and I felt better. Then I could get more work done mm-hmm. and I felt better doing it. Yeah. So my point is, is I was talking to her. 
And I said, yeah, so you're a nutritionist and you, you give pe- she does online coaching for it and she gives people, um, you know, diet plans and things like that. And then we started talking about cold plunging. She's like, yep, love it. Yep. Started talking about the sauna. Yep, love it. Started talking about stem cells. Yep, that's cool. So I'm like, there's so many connections. So it's the same type of principle. Oh, yeah. As soon as you talk to somebody that is interested in alternative ways of like eating clean yeah. or eating, you know, grass fed, locally yeah. sourced stuff. Yeah. Like not talking about like, well, what, you know, yeah. So different proteins and things like that. And it's just, it's kind of the same thing where you start digging in with it with somebody yeah. and you have all these similarities because you're doing your research. Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing with raw food that in our community, you know, e-collars, prong collars, slip leashes, anything that's not a harness and flexies, that's all a similar, like everyone's like, yeah, that's what you do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like there's, it's, it's second nature. Like mm-hmm. that's how we train dogs because yeah. that's what yields the results, especially with the dogs that we are catering to, you know, in our world. So when you get into conversations about nutrition and diet, everyone's like, who do you, what raw do you feed? Mm-hmm. It's that, not even. That's amazing. I mean. It's cool. It's cool that you're seeing that because even mm-hmm. as a raw dog food company, we I mean, I, I guess maybe we're growing really fast, so we're getting a lot of kibble feeders, people that are coming to us. And what happens is even very smart people, people that know a lot about nutrition for themselves, understand that ultra-processed food is not the way to eat, still have a hard time sometimes making that jump for their dogs. And I think it's because of what they're hearing, you know, mainly from the vet community. So you get a new puppy, you bring your dog to the vet. The vet might be wonderful. Vets are great. They're super smart. They have to go to school for a really long time. But the nutrition piece of it is flawed, right? Um, and so the vet's telling them, oh, no, 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 you cannot. If you're going to feed raw, like, that's really dangerous. It might not be complete in balance. It's going to be path- – there's going to be bacteria. It could make your whole family sick. It could make the dog sick. <laughs> you know, all of these – and then what are they – of course they're going to be scared about it, you know? So we're constantly having to be like – Here's what you can tell your vet. Like, this is how we're complete and balanced, formulated by a PhD nutritionist. Here's how we address the bacteria. Um, You know, here's the quality of the food. But there's a lot. People start, even very smart people who understand about nutrition for themselves, start from a place of fear and uncertainty. And, you know, that can be tricky when you're transitioning a dog from kibble to raw because if anything goes wrong at all, like – just the dog might have loose stools or something. They're very quick to abandon it because they already are so fearful about it. Um, So I think that what I've learned is that you really kind of have to be ready to start the raw diet. Like you have to be in that mindset fully. Um, And I think we try, that's why it's so important for us to educate, educate, educate. We're always trying to educate because that's really what gets people over the edge. And, um, you know, even... uh, you know, with, with the vet community, um, it's, it's really kind of a, I know we were talking about getting into this, but I, I'm always careful about this because we don't want to bash vets and vets are wonderful. We work with vets, conventional vets. We have conventional vets who feed our food. Um, but they will admit that they didn't learn anything about this in vet school. Um, and what they are taught is, uh, what kibble funded studies, you know, that's where they get their information. I read recently that 100% of the nutritional information that vets get come from big pet food. So ultra-processed pet food is feeding all of the nutritional information they're getting. Um, wow, that sounds very familiar <laughs> to what we get fed from our doctors. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I think with humans, we've started to almost question it more. Like there's a little bit more. We're farther along than we are with the dogs. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's really, I think another eye opening fact is that the largest vet clinic chain is owned by the largest ultra processed pet food manufacturer, Yeah, you know, 2,500 vet hospitals. So that, that's not by accident. <laughs> that didn't no. happen by accident. They're washing each other's hands like this. <laughs> and I don't think the vets are not there. It's not like you go to a vet and they, they don't want to tell the patient, the client, you know, the best food to feed, but they truly believe that that is the best food to feed. But like. You really, I know there's so much information out there and I always say like, gosh, it must be so hard to be a pet parent these days and be like, okay, I'm getting this over no here, shit, yeah. getting this over here. We're telling you something else. But what I say is just try mm-hmm. to, amidst all of that, use common sense because common sense will tell you like 100%. ultra processed food. There is not a scientist on earth that would deny that dry pet food is not ultra processed. It's ultra processed, right? So who, 
we know ultra processed food is bad. We know what it does to us. Like how could that possibly be the best thing to feed your dog for an entire lifetime, meal after meal? So I think that is where people sort of have the light bulb moment, like it's true, okay. Um, but then they'll get into like, but what does it have to be raw? Like why raw? <laughs> you know, yeah. can it be like cooked? And then we have to sort of explain, but this is, um, the and way. even that would be better than the oh, ultra. Oh yeah, it would, <laughs> like, it would. Like real food is better, yeah, right? Yeah, always. Ultra processed pet food is not real food. And that's what I always say about like the history of dog food. You know, before kibble was invented in 1956, by the way, like less than a hundred years ago, uh, people are always shocked by that because we just assume it's been around forever. Like, yeah. I don't know, like out in nature or something, but, um, <laughs> like little know, kibble trees, yeah, <laughs> little kibble trees. Um, but you know, dogs, I think the first dog biscuit was invented in 1860 by a businessman who saw um, stray dogs eating hard tack, which is like like a processed food for sailors off on docks. And he's like had a light bulb moment, um, created this the first dog biscuit. Then there was canned, in 1920, there was canned dog food, which was made from horse meat. And then by World War II, they had to start to, um, there was a shortage of metal, so they had to stop canning. And that's when... Purina uh, invented the first dog chow in 1956, and the rest is history. It's been dominating the industry ever since. So it's been dominating because the un, what you're doing is just coming along. So you have yeah. so it's the same thing we see in dog training, mm -hmm. same exact thing, where you have um, a vet that's getting funded and or supported mm -hmm. by a dog training school organization etc. Happens the same thing. This is how you train because these are our colleagues and associates. Mm -hmm. It'd be like if I all of a sudden was like, yeah, we're going to, everyone should feed kibble. And you're like, what the heck, man? Like, I, <laughs> right. th I thought we were working on educating right. people on the, the benefits of raw food. Mm -hmm. Doesn't work, right? You have to be true to what you believe in. So it's the same thing we see with dog training, same mm -hmm. exact thing. Yep. Just dog trainers, or I'm sorry, vet clinics, well, a lot of them, because people don't understand, it's crazy, like, people don't understand. A lot of the vet clinics, the national chains, are owned by one particular company. Mm -hmm. And then they also own, oh, they also maybe own PetSmart, or maybe they own this, or maybe they own that. And then all of a sudden, like, when the whole Stop the Shock came out with PetSmart or whatever, like, there was all backdoor things mm -hmm. going on that people were like, yeah. And mm -hmm. the reality was, is they were just gearing up for another thing to make money mm -hmm. and it's people don't see that mm -hmm. and so it's the same exact thing that we see all the time where it's smaller vets that aren't owned by somebody are a little bit easier to work with mm -hmm. because they're not getting funded by you know in your case like science diet or something like that mm -hmm. it's the same thing with like yeah it, it's a it's a whole thing and it but to your point of what you were talking about it's the same thing with humans where we're getting to a point now, like uh, where education is coming out. People are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Do we, are you sure we have to do surgery? Are you sure I need to take that mm -hmm. medication? Mm -hmm. Are you sure I, I need anxiety meds? Are you sure that I need this? Like, it's just, this is what we do. You're going to, you're going under the knife. This it's just how, and I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to get into it, but I've, I'm, I'm a human. Yeah. I'm a civilian yeah. and I educate myself almost every day from doctors and professionals with PhDs doing interviews just like this. And they're saying like, Hey, these things are starting to come out where you don't realize that all the stuff you're literally getting fed physically and mentally, somebody is paying for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like big pharma is paying for that. Mm -hmm. And big pharma also owns dog food companies mm -hmm. and it just keeps going down the line. Mm -hmm. And so when there's a company like yours that comes in that says, Hey, ultra processed sure you can feed that there's no yeah, whatever but there's an alternative so it's mm -hmm. the same exact thing that we see with human beings mm -hmm. like i was just talking to this lady that i went out and volunteered my time at a shelter in arizona her son was like 18 or something like that and toured like all the cls that you could mcl acl etc mm -hmm. right like really messed him up yeah. in ath and in, in a sports thing and mm -hmm. all the doc and this is just you know again advisory that you know, I'm not a doctor or anything, but just in a, just in a conversation is all the doctors were like, yeah, we need to do two or three surgeries. And they're like, he's 18. They're mm -hmm. like, yeah, he's going to be off his feet for 12 months or whatever. And he may never play sports again. And they're like, he's 18. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. 
and they ended up doing alternatives and they didn't do surgery and he fully healed and all the doctors were like whoa you know they did peptides and stem cells and um, PT and etc and it, it just it goes to show that and it's tough because doctors veterinarians even in our field like we we have conversations a lot about behaviorist mm-hmm. there's i th- again like vets are very important like my dog just tore her one of her acls basically and so yeah we're gonna go to a vet we're gonna go to a specialist like that's what they do mm-hmm. right but you're not you shouldn't go there for behavior because that's not what they do mm-hmm. and then same thing with the behaviorist like you go to a behaviorist, their job clinically, historically at scale as generalization is to diagnose what the problem is, mm-hmm. not to train your dog. Mm-hmm. They give you a prescription and they say, okay, here you go. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. There's plenty of dogs that definitely do need medication, but they should be working in conjunction with a professional trainer. And that's something that we see all the time is, you know, people will go in and say, hey, my dog's overweight. And they'll say, oh, you need, you know, in your case that you need uh you know, low fat content kibble or something. Mm-hmm. It's like, maybe they just that's need true. to stop kibble. Yeah, right. That's <laughs> right? True. Or that's never going to be an. It's never going to be given. a thing. I, our nutritionist that we work with says um, vets fix broken animals. Nutritionists keep them from breaking in the first place. Mm. Um, and I think it's a great quote. And I think that especially that's it. especially that's true. Nice. Like they, yeah, it's great. And I think that um, you know. There are, again, amazing vets out there, and they're great at fixing broken Absolutely. animals, and they're great at a lot of things, but we have to face the truth, which is that the nutrition piece of it is flawed. They're not, they haven't been given unbiased information. It's very biased information, and the fact that you can, the only safe food that you can feed is ultra-processed food from one of the big five pet food companies has to make you stop and think. It should. <laughs> right? It should, and I think, you know, once people sort of, start to learn about it they do and a lot of it they start to uncover other things but um you know I I, we also hear a lot of times like well my dog not a lot but once in a while you'll get that person saying well my dog ate you know kibble until he was 16 and he was totally fine we're like okay that's great we're really happy that that happened but there's also people who smoke yeah. <laughs> two packs a day and a six pack and eat chicken wings and it's just genetics. I know it's genetics or something. You win know. the lottery. Also like who the hell knows like were they also taking any any other medications to like keep them going? How great did they really feel? And also think about how much longer he could have lived, you yeah. know? Um, what our nutritionist talks about um, he was at like a trade show and one of the, um, you know, uh, dry uh, food reps was talking about how her cat has been doing so well on this dry food and she's 16 and it's just, she, you know, all of this other stuff about healthier, you know, fresh foods or raw food is just, you know, should, shouldn't really be paid attention to. And he walked away and he heard her like a few minutes later telling someone else that her cat has been on insulin shots for the last five years, you know? So it's Mm -hmm. like, okay, well, your cat's 16, but how Mm -hmm. are they thriving really? Mm -hmm. Um, So I do think that it can happen, but it's not the norm in the vast majority of people and dogs (laughs) eating ultra processed food, you're going to have problems. And we're seeing that. We're seeing that in the statistics all the time. Cancer's huge. Yeah. Cancer is really big. I mean, we should probably talk about, I mean, I always say like the kibble, the three major strikes against kibble are that it's jam packed with highly refined carbs. Okay. So cheap, fast digesting carbs that spike blood sugar. Um, Dogs have no nutritional need for carbohydrates, zero requirement for carbohydrates in their diet. But then we have some of these kibble companies putting anywhere from 40 to 70% carbs in the food. Second, the ingredients are really low quality. So, um, you know, the cheap, highly refined grains, plant-derived proteins, and then rendered animal proteins, which we can talk about later. If you want is that to. like dead animals? Well, it is dead animals, but not in the way that we want. Like, uh, usually died other than by slaughter. Um, roadkill? Roadkill it can be. It can be euthanized animals. It can even be euthanized dogs and cats. It can be. Yeah, I've, I've read that. Like, yeah. I did a podcast many, many years ago. And they were going over like what's legally allowed to be in dog food without saying it's in dog food. Yeah. And there was like one ingredient that was like, these are literally euthanized cats and dogs in your dog food. Yeah. I think I read recently that it's either two or three of the big rendering plants in the U.S. are allowed to accept euthanized pets as part Just of the Just to fill collection. it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a really effective waste management system, right? Like where does all of that waste go? Where does all, all the shelter dogs that are you know, get euthanized or the vet clinics or, you know, the farm animals that are diseased and die that way. Where does that all go into landfills? No. So it goes into our pet's food a lot of the time. So, um, 
Rendering is basically, um, they just collect this animal matter from all different places. It can be expired grocery store meat. It can be, you know, euthanized animals. It can be, um, you know, just... If that's not enough to make you scratch your head. I know. And it's, but, and then, so what happens is they take it to the <clears throat> rendering facility. They grind it all up. Sometimes with the animals that are still in the plastic bags with the tag still on, everything just goes into the grinder. Like hot dogs. Yeah. <laughs> And then they put it in a, like a big vat and they boil it like a stew. And then they skim the fat off the top. And then the rest they dry into a powder. And that is then sold to pet food manufacturers as a protein powder. So anything with a meal next to it, so chicken byproduct meal, um, you know, animal fat, um, you know, any of those things are rendered are from a rendering facility. Mm-hmm. facility. Um, so you just have to be careful. I think that it's supposed to be a little bit better if um, it's not a generically named. So if it says chicken meal, you know it actually comes from the chicken. Um, If it just says animal byproduct meal, it can be from like any mammal. So that could be cats and dogs. And this is why there will be recalls and there have been recalls um, because of sodium pentobarbital, which is the euthanasia drug. Yeah. Um, and then there's also, you know, just last year, there was a university that uh, tested a bunch of different pet foods uh, and found dog DNA and quite a few few of them. So how do you think the dog DNA is getting in there? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a pretty nasty business. Uh, it's just mass produced, mm-hmm. lack of education. And I think... And again, I'm I kind of like the d- dog owner in this conversation. I know that you are too, but you have so much more education on it. But for me, it's like being a professional aside. It's one of those things that if I think dog owners are genuinely like they will spend more money on their dogs than themselves mm-hmm. or their kids. They care more. Mm-hmm. And I feel like if they know this information and hopefully this podcast highlights that. Mm-hmm. Like if you go to like Burger King, you know what you're going to get, right? You're like, oh, it may taste good, right? This kibble may taste good. Mm -hmm. Where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. How long is like, how long has this been frozen? Years? Did it come from China? Like how, how are these tomatoes grown? Yeah. Like how much chemicals are in this pickle? Yeah. What's the fries like? Where's the grease? Right. Where's the person that, you know? So I think with dog food, it's even scarier because dog owners will spend more money on their dogs than they will themselves because that's just the type of humans that we are. But they don't know these things. They don't that, know that. Like, right. Your kibble is highly processed. The minerals and nutrients are probably imported from a European or mm-hmm. Asian com- mm-hmm. or country. Mm-hmm. And yeah, by paper it says that it's in there, mm-hmm. but it's not. It's like the same thing if we go get um, vitamins that are – you know, you're getting like 10% of what you should. So you think yeah. you're supplementing when you're not. So these are all things that just blows my mind that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really kind of scary when you dig scary. into it. It's really scary. I think like the the other thing about kibble is that, you know, almost always it's feed, feed grade ingredients, meaning they are not, they have been deemed unsafe to enter the human food supply. They do not pass U.S. food safety laws. Mm. <laughs> so once you get there, it's like, okay, well, what really, I mean, that's pretty scary, right? And then I would say the final thing about kibble, this is a, the third final thing, and it's not the final thing, I guess these are the three major strikes. The third strike is that it's highly, highly, highly processed, cooked and extruded at around 350 degrees Fahrenheit four times over. So high heat processed, an average of four mm. times. And this is really interesting because there's a growing body of research that is uh, demonstrating just how damaging that type of processing is mm. to the already low quality ingredients in there. And what they're discovering is that when you uh, high heat process uh, sugars and protein, so starch and meat basically, they create these carcinogenic compounds called AGEs, uh, which stands for advanced glycation end products. And um, these cause all sorts of diseases, cancer, uh, metabolic dysfunction, uh, kidney disease, kidney, yeah. ne- neurologic disease. Um, and what's really horrifying about what they've discovered is when they've tested these processed pet foods, the levels um, present in processed pet food are 100 times that of the levels present in processed people food. Whoa. So like our dogs are just getting assaulted with these AGEs every time they eat. Um, 
the same meal too. Like we, AGEs can be in, in people's, people food too, right? Sure. Um, but are we eating that same thing <laughs> meal after meal? Um, every day. Every day for an entire lifetime. Um, and they've also tested uh, the levels of AGEs in uh, different types of pet food. Um, and the ones obviously with the, the, low, the lowest levels are fresh raw foods because they're the least processed. So it's really no surprising when you start to dig in that these statistics exist that are, you know, showing us all of these. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that's but I think it's just people just don't know. I know they don't know. I mean, I'm still learning all of this stuff, and luckily I can work with these experts and you know get pointed in the right direction. And I'm just sort of. You know, so let, yeah. Uh, what's your tattoo mean, by the way? Oh, this is it's just a lucky number. Cool, eleven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So let's talk about this because yeah. we could go probably all day about why kibble is not as good as raw food, and yeah. to some degree, kibble is actually. Like you're better off just going, getting turkey. And if you don't like raw food, cooking the turkey, giving them rice Mm -hmm. and then adding in something like the kibble that you're feeding your dog is likely got roadkill in it, other dead cats. Um, I mean, it's a pet. You can't say across the board. No, I know. Not every company. Yes. But there are chances and very high chances. There's that a very high chance that, that happens. Yes. There. Yes. yes. Not all. Not. But, but, but yes. Uh, the majority of people, I would say, that go to the store to buy the cheapest brand because they're like, Oh, my dog loves this. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Like where humans are addicted to sugar. Mm -hmm. Of course you love it Mm -hmm. because it's terrible for you. That's the goal of these companies. They want you addicted to it. Mm -hmm. So you never stop not drinking it or eating it. Like it's, it's, it's the same thing. Anyway, it's, it's crosses my life path. So, so nicely. Cause like, I'm, like I said, I'm getting, you know, I go to a naturopathic doctor Mm -hmm. So what's the quote you said earlier about nutritionists yeah. are preventative? Yeah, vets fix broken animals. Nutritionists keep them from breaking in the first place. Yeah, yeah. it's the same thing with humans. Yeah, yeah. So I go to a naturopathic doctor. Yeah. And so I do blood work at least every six months. That's great. We check everything, mm-hmm. everything. Like my liver. So like even my liver was a little, my liver uh, filtration system was a little down. So I'm taking a supplement for that. And then we're going to recheck it. I, d- I did genetic methylation tests to, to see what my genetics were like. Now we're supplementing for that. And I feel, so anyway, I'm dialed in. Yeah, you're biohacking. I want to, I'm biohacking, yeah. exactly. And I want to be mainly for my son. My son is yeah. what really influenced me to be healthy because mm-hmm. I know that one day I'm going to leave this world mm-hmm. and I'm going to leave him and my other future kids mm-hmm. And I want to be here as long as I can. And I also want to be as healthy as I can while I'm here. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's important to me. And it's the same thing with dogs. Like dogs have such a short period of life here Mm -hmm. and we love them unconditionally Mm -hmm. and in a different way. And if you're listening to the podcast, podcast or watching it, we can all agree like dogs are such a blessing to, to the world for many different ways. And we should want to keep them healthy Mm -hmm. And understanding that just because your dog likes food and will chow it down doesn't mean it's good for them. Mm -hmm. And just because somebody has fancy marketing and with these cool, like beautiful pictures of a, you know, it's interesting. They use raw chicken, raw beef, (laughs) raw salmon, raw vegetables on their bag, Yeah, you know, but none of it is, none of is it, that's not going into your dog. Or if it is, it's a very small amount and the quality is low. So let's get into like the real reason why people... There's two big reasons why I think people are hesitant to get into raw food, which I think we should just dive into. Uh, First reason is the people don't understand the chemicals and the gut system that dogs have, and they have the ability to break down these proteins, bones, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that I've learned over the years. I had this story, uh, I've told it before, but I was getting my dog, Lakota. She's a Dutch Shepherd. I got her from like an old school dog handler, right? She's just a badass woman that just, you know, smokes cigarettes and drinks room temperature cream ales. Like she's (laughs) badass, right? But she's been working with dogs her whole life. And I remember I went over there and she's like, yeah, that's dad. He's a military, you know, ex dropout type Dutchie. And she's like, do you want to feed him? I'm like, yeah, sure. She's like, yeah, go in there. So I took out this, I could put a glove on. I took out this raw uh, chicken thigh, mm-hmm. completely raw skin on, you know, the white with the, mm-hmm. and she's, and I'm like, okay. And I knew about raw food, yeah. but I, I didn't know about this raw yeah. food. She's like, yeah, just go out there and throw it to him. Mm-hmm. 
So people would be like, you know, their their cable gets on the ground and people are like, oh no. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm watching this dog crunch <laughs> this chicken thigh with dirt and stones and grass in it. But I think that's the first thing that I would love to talk to you about is understanding that dogs ability to break down raw food is not the same as if because we because that's the thing i think everyone gets hesitant and i think that that's where vets kind of scare people into fear-mongering them of like you can't eat raw chicken because of you know when we all grow up oh salmonella like oh yeah yeah, you're gonna get sick like we're always and it's true of course yeah (laughs) but we're always like even like as kids you know growing up i have this fear of like chicken you know and then i worked in some restaurants so it's this huge thing but understanding that dogs can eat a full dogs can go kill a chicken when they're alive Mm -hmm. snap their neck let them bleed out eat the whole thing feathers and all yeah and be fine yeah so can you explain how how dogs and cats can break down raw food Mm -hmm. and why we can't and how it's different yeah and why it's normal for them to do so yeah before i start i just think it's so funny that because people see their dogs eating so many disgusting things. Like poop. People fed dogs poop, their own poop. Other dogs Rocks. poop. Like sometimes there's like a dead animal in the backyard, but they're they not it. rushing them to the vet, right? It's just yeah. like, okay. Yeah. Of uh, us raw food, God forbid. Um, yeah. So dogs are, um, I think experts will tell you that all you have to do is look at an animal's biological makeup, whether that's human, dog, horse, whatever, and it reveals to you what they should be eating, okay? Horses. Yes. They are herbivores. They have long digestive tracts. They need a lot of fiber. They eat hay. They eat, you know, plants. Um, This is what they need, right? Their biological makeup shows us that. Dogs are facultative carnivores. You're going to get so many comments that say they're omnivores. We always say call them what you will, okay? They're meat eaters. Um, They have sharp pointy teeth for ripping and tearing meat. They have uh, no sideways movement of the jaw or big flat molars for grinding up plant matter. They have no amylase in their saliva for breaking down plant matter. They have short, fast digestive tracts and a high level of hydrochloric acid in their stomachs for breaking down bacteria. Everything about their anatomy shows us that they are designed to derive their nutrients from a raw meat-based diet. <laughs> I mean, it's And all until there. puppies start getting born with like denture looking like flat teeth, <laughs> right. that's the way shit's going to go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this exactly. Is look really... at a horse. That's a good point. Yeah. Look at horse teeth, right? <laughs> they kind of look like dentures. Look at a dog's tooth. Go ahead and lift that up. Look at a cat's tooth, right? They have these right. canines for a reason. Yeah. And then people will say like, and it's not just the teeth. It's all of the things combined. Yeah. Right. And it's also that. That's like, on the forefront. Yes. Dogs are, we, you know, in the last 30,000 years since they've evolved from wolves, they, the inside has not changed really. Okay. Very, very little change. Um, We've bred dogs for their looks, their behavior, their temperament. We didn't breed dogs for their digestion. We didn't say like, oh, what? let's make them digest starch better. You mm-hmm. know, that's just not how it works. And just because kibble came along in 1956 doesn't mean dogs lost the ability to digest their evolutionary diet. That's just not the way that evolution works. Um, so they are meat eaters. They can digest raw meat. Just as a side note, because we get this comment a lot, and I talk to our, the nutritionists we work with a lot about this. There is a study that came out um, years, I don't know how long, maybe like 10 years, five years, uh, that proved that uh, dogs have a slightly better ability to digest starch than their ancestors or wolves. And so people, these kibble companies take that and they're like, oh, well then let's give them starches. So let's give them like, I don't know, what, it's 70% starch. Yeah. Like just because dogs have developed some ability to digest a tiny bit of starch doesn't mean we should just be like overloading them with it. And the nutritionist we work with says, you know, we've developed the ability to metabolize alcohol, but just because alcohol is metabolizable doesn't mean we should make it a major part of our diet. Like it's still not good for them. It still shouldn't be what's dominating their food. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't, it's, I think that we do take an extra safety step with our food. Um, we do cold pressurization, um, which is basically an all natural process that uses um, uh, cold water at extreme pressure to inactivate potentially harmful pathogens. So E. coli, salmonella, listeria. This is a necessary step because the FDA has a zero tolerance policy for pathogenic bacteria in all pet food. So raw companies that aren't doing something like this I mean, you're just at a risk for constant recalls. Um, it also, 
We're, we're proud to use it. I mean, it's expensive, but we incur the extra cost because it's a safer product for the people feeding it in the home too, right? That's the HPP process. Yeah, HPP, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's like a, in the, it seems in the raw feeding group, that's like a dirty word. Well, for the purists, but I think there's also a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, just misinformation about it. Um, it's not, it's, it's used ubiquitously in people food, baby food, juices, Hummus, what's, the pro- okay, what's the process? So basically, um, the way it works with us is we the food is made, it's packaged in BPA-free packaging. Uh, then it goes through the HPP machine, so it's submerged in water, just water, <laughs> pure cold water, nothing else, no chemicals, again, no heat. And then the pressure is 87,000 PSI. The pressure inactivates these harm, potentially harmful pathogens. So it's a safer product. Uh, it also allows us to... Be, you know, stay within the guardrails of what the FDA is. Exactly. Know. And, um, cause there's other companies that could, could bypass that and, and not do it. But at some, it's kind of like not paying your taxes. Yeah. There's just going to be a it's point a in time where somebody's going to come and say, Hey, we're yeah. shutting you down because you're not aligned by our, yeah. our rules and regulations. And even the people that are anti HPP mm-hmm. I found, um, and then you feed another company that does not HPP. Um, and then that company has a recall. Those same people don't really stand behind that company all that well. You know, it's like it's you start to lose trust, and it's like it's just really not good for the raw industry as a whole. Honestly, if any raw company has a recall, it's bad for the entire industry uh, because mm. people already don't trust it. So uh, we feel like it's safe. It, it is a safer way to feed. Um, it's safer for the people in the home. So young children. Uh, immunocompromised people, immunocompromised dogs. I mean, let's be honest. So the healthy dog can handle plenty of bacteria, right? Um, but they're not all dogs have a healthy gut microbiome, depending on how they've been fed, right? Especially if they've been feeding cardboard their yeah. whole life. Yeah. So, I mean, some dogs might not do as well with that extra bacteria, but a healthy dog will be fine with it. And we're not really using that step um, totally for the dog's health. It's really for the people feeding it. And that's really honestly what the FDA is most concerned about too, is that the people in the home feeding raw uh, are doing it safely. Yeah. And that, when I had the conversation with you about it, when, cause you, when did you guys switch to H? Probably, oh my gosh, maybe, um, has it been four years now? Okay. How do I lose track of time when you're Me in too. this business? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like, was it yeah. 400 years or four months? My, it's kind of like a big long yeah. thing for me. But yeah. one thing that you said when we were having a conversation yeah. about you know, and just so people know, like, again, people, companies will approach me and say, Hey, you know, we'd like to partner with you. And I'm always, it's an interview process, you know, for me. And that's something that we did and and, and vice versa. Right. It's like, yeah, we want to make sure that this is mutual for, you know, our community and and the people who are watching us and the people who are consuming your uh, food and people consuming my content. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you guys had said about the process and what you're doing is is you said like, Hey, you know, there's other people who don't really agree with this, with the process of that. But, you know, you have a young son Mm -hmm. and that was really important to me is like when my dogs eat, we feed raw and then they go and lick my son's face, Mm -hmm. I'll know and have a better thing in the back of my head of like all of that bacteria that is good for dogs Mm -hmm. and okay for dogs Mm -hmm. or normal for dogs to digest and break down. Mm -hmm. Young kids can't, people can't in general. Right. So that's important. That was important to me that if you have young kids or because you, cause there's people, that, like you said, like the purist or there's people who just like you can go to uh, a really cheap market, you know, the like the Aldi's and things that sell things for cheap for whatever reason. I'm not sure. I'm not educated in that, but mm-hmm. they'll get like chicken backs for really cheap, mm-hmm. but they don't have that process. And if you don't have kids at home or whatever, sure. Mm-hmm. But just I think it's I think it's just important for people to understand that you guys are doing it right. Mm hmm. And if, yeah. and if you had decisions, you might choose other decisions in the long run. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you're like, you guys are doing it right. You're going by the book. You don't want anything to interfere with the progress in the company that you guys are building. And so, yeah, and it even costs you more money yes. to just fall under the lines of like, yeah. we're going to do it right. Right. Yeah, and we, I think that shines through. I think that that's important for your company, for people to understand that people may not agree with like, oh, well, you're taking out the bacteria that the dogs need or that's healthy for them. But it's like, we don't have a choice. Mm-hmm. Like we're... Yeah scalable company yeah. and we plan to be here for a long period of time yeah. and we don't want anybody knocking on our door saying hey you haven't been doing this yeah. we're shutting you down then your company looks bad because yeah. then there's a there's an article that comes out that says we feed raw 
get shut down because of this. Yeah. And to the general public, they're going to be like, oh, oh, yeah. what's that mean? Yeah. And the reality is, is so that's a good thing. That yeah, it's a very good thing. And it's a safety step that's necessary. There's really, I see no choice, honestly. Exactly. It's like, I mean, people can say what they want, but it's like, you don't have a okay. choice. And we don't have a choice. And I'm not going to, if you do it yourself and you're doing DIY exactly. raw, like fine, great, exactly. I'll more power to you. But we are a company that's trying to exactly. stay in business and get raw into as many bowls as possible. And this is a great, a lot of people, as many people, and honestly, I think more people are happier with the HPP than not. People will ask us like, do you use HPP? Because I won't use a company that doesn't. So, I mean, it's definitely something people are becoming more educated on looking for. I think maybe as the vets soften, soften a little bit, It'll be easier. They ask that question, how they start to understand what HPP is. And this is like the way that we address the dangerous bacteria. So that's a big, that's a big piece uh, to that. So to, to reiterate the HPP process Mm -hmm. is essentially the FDA had said, Hey, if you're going to feed raw to general public, offer it as a company Mm -hmm. to everybody, you guys have to take out these particular bacteria's in order for you to be scalable to the United States? Well, it's not really like that. They just say, they don't care how you, uh, so there's a zero tolerance policy, like none, no dangerous bacteria can be in any pet food, kibble included, or you'll have okay. a recall, okay? So they don't care how you do that. If you cook it, if you use irradiation, if you use HPP, it's your choice. Most raw companies in the US will use HPP because it's the gentlest way to- Doesn't take out the nutrition. It, exactly. Because it's cold water. Yeah, it's cold water at extreme pressure. Um, so that's why it's so popular, but the, the FDA doesn't tell you what kill step you need to be using. Um, that's just up to the pet food company. So that's why it's the most popular. And honestly, um, any bigger raw pet food company in the U S is using it. So, right. Yeah. Cool. No, yeah, yeah, that's, that's important. Cause it's like, Oh, HPP. Cause when people are, so in the comments, right. That's the thing with dog training. And that's why it's so interesting for me as a creator that uh, going back to what you were saying before about the process of how even training works or mm-hmm. dogs work or pet food works or nutrition works. It's I'm really big in results, evidence that you can see in front of you, not on a piece of paper, not on what you read online. Like I want to see, like if you go and you see it, like that's why I'm really excited about my new series with my puppy is I'm going to train this, this dog is the, t- so the reason why I got this dog yeah. is it's the toughest, one of the toughest dogs I've ever worked with just on genetics Hmm. So I've worked with a couple Mm -hmm. and the genetics of the dog are very consistent. They are like, um, I know I'm big. Mm -hmm. I'm confident. I'm pushy. I'm testy. I'm the most, uh, one of the most loyal dogs you'll see Mm -hmm. the hardest to crack. Like they're not buddies with everybody. Mm. Like they're not the golden retriever. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you have to really work in order to gain their trust. And once you're in, then you have this 200 pound bodyguard kind of walking around. And I don't suggest anybody getting this dog Mm -hmm. really, (laughs) unless you really know what you're doing. Because the reason why I get called to some of these cases with these dogs is they're in the wrong hands. 100%, 100%, mm-hmm. which is most breeds. But my point is, is with, with raw food and with my training that I'm doing with this puppy, with like the, I pick the hardest dog that I've worked with mm-hmm. that's safest for my family, which is why like, you know, when I posted, it's like, everyone's like, adopt, don't shop. And I'm like, I've done more for shelters mm-hmm. than anybody that's commenting on these things, right? Like I, I, I donate my time, I donate money, I, mm-hmm. whatever, mm-hmm. right? But I pick this particular dog and I paid for these genetics mm-hmm. for that particular reason. Mm-hmm. And so my point is, is when I'm building this dog up and at six months, he's this really well-trained dog that historically is really challenging if I can train this really tough dog, anybody at home can train the dog they have at home. Because mm-hmm. I took one of the hardest dogs that I've worked with, breed-wise, genetic-wise, as a protective, really pushy breed, mm-hmm. and I've trained it to this point. Mm-hmm. And here's how I did it. Right. And if you have a dog at home, I can almost promise you that you're going to fall right in line because mm-hmm. this is a really tough dog. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing with raw food. Is When I started, I tell this story a lot, and we've talked about it, why I started feeding raw many years ago with my first dogs was uh, my my ex-girlfriend, her, when I was with her, I'm really bad with years, right? <laughs> so like 12, I'd say 12, 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'd say 12, 15 years ago-ish. We both got St. Bernard's, right? So she got one and I got one. And her St. Bernard had had really bad hot spots. Mm-hmm. And so we worked with a local vet around here. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, holistic vet. She's amazing. Her name's Chris Dallas. I hope to have her on the podcast someday. She's, she's again, like 
proactive instead of reactive. Okay, now we have cancer. Now what do we do? Just keep it alive until. She's like, let's, let, let's not get cancer, right? So she talked about raw food, which was amazing. So she said, do raw food. Cleared up every hot spot he had immediately. Boom. Two weeks when I say immediately, Amazing. right? That is immediately two weeks. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, sold. Mm -hmm. How do I get this? Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Mm -hmm. Then when my St. Bernard, he used to eat four cups of raw or uh, kibble and he'd poop out four cups. And then when I started feeding him raw food, he would poop, poop out these little nuggets. <laughs> I know. Yeah, right? These little nuggets. And this is a 150 pound yeah, dog. He like, would what? poop this much. You know, you yeah. get like a shovel. <laughs> yeah. And then he'd poop out these little nuggets. And I looked it up. And it's because all of the nutrition that he was eating, because he was eating close to four pounds a day mm -hmm. in his prime, which is big. It's a lot of food. Yeah. And, and it would all go into his body. Right, and he'd start drinking less water. Mm -hmm. So a Saint Bernard, if you own big dogs, mastiffs, Saint Bernards, these big dogs, yeah. all day long they're drinking yeah. water. Yeah. Start drinking less water. I started looking it up. And he said, "Oh, well, raw food provides mo moisture. Yeah, more moisture, yeah. more more water, mm -hmm. more hydration, mm -hmm. and that was huge for me, especially in the summer months." Mm -hmm. So I'm like, "Wow, this is amazing." And it and it was also this. So this is interesting. It's the same type of st poop and stool that. The wolves that I was working with in Colorado were pooping out. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. So they were getting fed raw meat, uh, you know, elk that were getting hit by cars, mm -hmm. whatever they yeah. could get. And these were timber wolves, like real wolves, mm -hmm. born in zoos and shit, right? And they were pooping out these little nuggets. It's the same thing with like owls with the pellets. Mm -hmm. They poop out the bones and the feathers and everything else is gone. Yeah. So they have these primal digestive yeah. systems to break down the proteins that they need to survive and be healthy. Mm -hmm. And so... For me, the, the correlation of the training is like, I want to see it. Yeah. I don't want to like, oh, well, I really like this because of this. And it's like, I don't like, I'm the type of person that I need to see it, right? I need to see what you're doing. I can't really learn. Like, I'm not a big reader. Yeah. I need to listen to podcasts. I need to eat. Like, I, I do ebooks, mm -hmm. audiobooks. Yeah. I need to see it. I need to hear it. I can't like, I'm, I just, this is how I learn, yeah, right? Yeah. So raw food is one of those things that it's not even a question to me, but um, so going to the next big thing of like, I already know, you know, I'm sold on raw food and my St. Bernard lived until he was 12. My other dog lived until she was 18 and I'm hoping Lakota lives and Burley lives all the way up into the teens as yeah. well. That was my experience with raw food. But the second thing is the price. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about like your experience with what, what is your process? Where do you get your meat from traditionally? Is it one source? Is it, so to talk about that because, because this thing is like, you, you have to make, it's not like you're making your prices because you are, want to get filthy rich. You're making your prices because the process of getting raw food delivered to your door mm -hmm. is insane. Like that yeah. whole pro, like when I always talk about raw food, we feed raw particularly, I'm like, they deliver it to your door. For free. For free. It's like, it's an amazing thing, yeah. but people are always like, well, the price. I'm like, I know. That's what we get. I mean, it's the so biggest just, complaint. It's, it's raw food. Dogs can't eat raw food because we can't eat raw food. Yeah. So we just talked about that. Yeah. Dogs can literally break down metal in their stomachs, right? <laughs> Let alone chicken liver, you know, mm -hmm. raw. Now mm -hmm. the price. So what's the process and why your prices or raw food company prices are where they're at? And, and the reason why kibble is so cheap, that's why you can go to go to Burger King and get four Whoppers and a fries for 20 bucks yeah. because it's low grade garbage. It yeah. makes you feel like shit. There's no nutrients. Yeah. It's been frozen for a long time. It's fried. It's terrible for you. Yeah. Yeah. We always um, say, don't ask why raw is so expensive. Ask why kibble is so cheap. Ooh. <laughs> Sound bite. Yeah, that's good. Um, but no, it's really quality costs more. I mean, that's, it's really that simple. I don't, I mean, I it, it. Costs, it costs us, it costs what it costs. It really just costs what it costs because we're paying. I mean, this isn't, if you want to get mad at a pet food company for like having like really great margins at your expense, like go to the kibble companies because we don't have those margins. Um, it's, it's hard to do this. Um, we have to be, be a business, right? Or we wouldn't be around to feed no, your you, dog. You're not, you mean you don't, you don't <laughs> yeah. want to like, we don't, don't want to do, do it for free? Yeah. So, I mean, we have pride ourselves on the sourcing, though. All of the food is sourced from farms that we trust in the U.S. And, awesome. And um, the lamb and venison come from venison, which um, come from venison, come from New Zealand, um, which I'm sure you know is one of the best countries. to. So they're just a clean country. So the lamb and venison are 100% grass-fed. 
Awesome. Uh, pasture raised. Um, so yeah, New Zealand and the U.S. Um, we produce mm -hmm. in a. It's not. We have a co-manufacturer that we. 100% trust we are the only pet food made in that facility. So are your um, yeah. sorry to interrupt are your 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 the food um okay so the meat that you get mm. are the farms that you're getting these from do they is it direct or is it like wholesale? Like, how does that work? I mean, I don't want to get too much into the manufacturing because I don't know all of the details because it's the co-man that but they basically buy from the same farms that they trust unless they can't find for example like if there's seasonality to things too like turkey liver like sure. we're, we're using a lot of different raw materials um but they all are have to be human grade sources they have mm -hmm. to so they come into even to come into our facility it has to be human grade because it's usda certified so again only pet food in in that facility um everything else is being made for human um yeah yeah that's, um that's so very strict safety not, there's i don't think there's one kibble company out there that's using a you know usda certified facility um and then um it's it goes to our hpp facility which is like an hour north um and then we um put it right into the freezer after that and it goes to one of our three distribution centers which we have strategically placed all around the country so that we can get it fast and quick to people. Does it come frozen? Comes frozen. Oh, from the, the from the slaughterhouse or from the farms. Um, I think it is frozen. Yeah. I think a lot of it is frozen. I would have to ask our head of production how exactly it's all coming in. Um, and then it's, it's frozen or then it's go through the HPP process to get rid of that. Yeah. So after it's ground up and all of the recipes are made and then it's packaged, okay. then it can't be frozen when it goes through HPP. It has to be cold, but not frozen. And then as soon as it's done going through the HPP, it goes into the freezers and then mm. it's shipped directly from there. So, I mean, we are cutting out the middleman too. There's a lot of brands that are in retail stores, which is great. They're available, but it's a lot, usually they're sitting there longer. So you'll see a lot more freezer burn. Um, you know, oxidation, um, with ours, it's like, really, there's not that step in between. So it's straight yeah. from us to, to you. So yeah, your chicken is, looks like chicken. I mean, everyone always says like, looks like straight from the butcher. Yeah. You know, they're really, I'm like, it, it, is, it is though. It's really like high quality. Um, so we really pride ourselves on that. Um, but the cost thing is, it's a hard thing for, pe for people to get over because we've been trained by big pet food to believe that you should only pay this much. I think the average pet owner pays between 30 and $60 a month to feed their dog. So Whoa. that's what people think you should be paying. But then I'm like, but then you also think it's okay to spend thousands of dollars to get this tumor removed, to have to pay for these allergy shots, like all of the symptoms. So they've allocated a lot more funds to the treatment of symptoms than they have to the food. Right. Um, so it's almost like a, a, a an unfair system. Yeah. It's the, They're I, like, yeah. we're going to get the dog sick. <laughs> well, yeah, not, not that's not their yeah. point, but you know, oh, hey. We're going to get him sick, right? So we own this this dog food company. We're going to get him, we're going to feed him really crappy food. Chances are, there's a really good chance because the percentage, do you know the percentage of dogs who have cancer and liver failure? I mean, do you have any of those numbers or? I mean, I know that 50% of dogs get cancer by the age of 10. I know that 6 million dogs die of cancer each year. Like so, and then, if, dogs. and then if 90% of dogs are being fed kibble, Right, so yeah, it's this ninety-five equal, actually ninety-five percent yeah. high nineties. So you have these. So listen. So this the raw the the cable companies they feed this junk food, they go through their life right, and then all of a sudden they get cancer or they get kidney failure or they get whatever the heck happens, mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, we also own this vet company. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't. I hate to get too conspiracy theorist. Um, I'm just, you know. I, I don't know. Like no, that's, it's, that's it's like the beauty of system. Like, exactly. And it, there, there's a lot of suspect things going on. And I think yeah, once suspect. you start to p dig into it, it's like, mm, that doesn't really make sense. That's what um, I'm saying. But more money up front, less money down the line. That's basically, and it's the same is true for us, right? I think people, what I've noticed mm -hmm. is that we don't have a lot of patience. So some things you'll see right away, right? Like you're saying, okay, you feed raw food. Within two weeks, you see shinier, healthier coat. You might see you see the smaller poops right away. You see the less water drinking right away. Some things take a little bit longer. Some things aren't as visible. It's like you have to be patient. Like if you or I switch from a, from an ultra processed diet to whole foods diet, healthy eating. Oh yeah. Some things are immediate. Some things take a longer time. It's not like going to the doctor and you have a sickness and here's a pill and you feel better the next day, right? But that's mm. just covering it up. It's like I think we have to get more patient mm. with some of these things and be willing to say like 
okay, this is like, I know this is better. I know this is some things will take time. You'll see your dog will maintain an ideal weight much more easily on a raw diet, right? They they lose the excess weight or gain what's needed very easily on a diet that's biologically appropriate. Yeah. Versus kibble. And I think, like you said, it's it's plain and simple, right? You get yeah. what you pay for. Yeah, you get period. what you pay for. I mean, we can't apologize. It's really, gosh, we struggle with it because we try not to be, we did something the other day on social that said, um, you know, just a big, sorry, a uh, slide, uh, slide that said kibble is a convenience food, not a health food. Mm-hmm. And I would say it got, you know, it was a very popular post. 50% of the comments were like, so supportive. 50% were like, this is so elitist. This is a privileged statement. How can you say this? And I'm like, but we're not saying you're a bad pet pet parent. We're just stating a fact. Like kibble yeah. was invented uh, as a convenient, yeah. cheap, cost-effective option for pet parents. It was not invented as, uh, you know, optimal health uh, nutrition for your dog. That's not why it was. So like, that is a fact. And I think like, we're not going to put you in pet food jail if you feed kibble. <laughs> like we're not like the I, pet food police, but yeah. we want to give you the most information so that you can do the best that you can do, whether that's adding a few blueberries or adding like some leftovers, you know, we didn't quite get into this. We almost did, but like the pet food companies, when they, you know, dry food came around and kibble was introduced, their biggest competition was people that were feeding table scraps because that's what dogs were eating before this, Mm. right? So they had to think of a way to scare people away from feeding that. And that's when people started to get really scared about, oh, can I feed this? Like, can I feed a carrot? Is it okay to feed the amount we, like on our blog, we have, you know, a lot of it is SEO. So it's like, you see what people are searching for. Can my dog eat raw eggs? Can my dog eat broccoli? Can my dog, people are constantly asking the internet, like what their dogs can eat because they've been trained to, you know, think that it's anything that isn't from scientifically formulated, you know, bag that it's dangerous for them. And dogs really, there's like maybe five, a handful of things they can eat, chocolate, uh, macadamia nuts, uh, onions, but like there's a whole world, grapes. Yep. There's a whole world of real foods that they can be eating, but that uh, marketing was brilliant by those cable companies because it's lasted to this day and people are still very afraid to feed real food. Yeah, and and that's that's a good point because I try to say that to people too. Like when I post these things, some people are like, "You shouldn't be spreading these." I'm like, "Look, I am, I'm not like it's not like we feed like I feed Imes or Purina, and we feed raw." Was like, "Hey, we want to partner with you to talk about our company." I'm like, "Yeah, sure, but I'm just gonna feed this." Like, mm. I, I it, it's interesting to to hear, and this is just social media in general. It's just one of those things that when I post something, I'm just talking about my experience and I put my money where my mouth is. Yeah. That's one thing I will say about everything that I do. I put my money where my mouth is. So if I'm training a dog and you're watching a video, you're going to see an outcome. Mm -hmm. You're going to see results. You're going to see something happen that the owner, like I want a healthier dog. I want a better relationship. I want my dog to walk nicer on the leash. I'm going to yield that results. I'm going to show you likely for free how to do it, right? right? Every now and then I'll say, if you want to buy my course, you can. Mm -hmm. But that's one thing that I see too is people are like, how how could you put this out there? So I think it's, it's just, it's education because there's still people that will say my vet, blah, blah, blah. And we kind of talked about that vets jobs. A, they don't know most vets unless they're nutritionists do not know about nutrition. I did the same thing when we, when we did, um, there was some people talking about way back in the day, I did a video on vets with training, right? So the most training behavior that a vet from what I remember will will go through I think it was Michigan State Mm -hmm. had the biggest training and behavioral thing as a veterinarian was like four weeks okay the most and what but the, the real problem isn't even the time which is obviously a problem what is the education they're getting and where is it coming from? It's coming right. from the, the university. That, that's what I'm saying that's is like funded by the, defunded. Yeah. Exactly. So do you want, that's why I always tell people like, do you want to like, do you want to learn, follow, listen, somebody who's boots on the ground every day, mm-hmm. getting their hands dirty with dogs, trying to figure out problems and solutions? Or do you want somebody that's reading a book and saying, well, this is what my university is saying. And this is, and I'm like, yeah, but they're, they're a, they're paying you. Yeah. And B, where's, where's the actual results? I don't yeah. care about a piece of, it's like somebody yeah. saying like, it's the same thing that we see in the healthcare systems yeah. with humans today. Yeah. There's doctors and nutritionists with yeah. PhDs that are saying you, you should do this and you should do that. And it's, and then it's like all... It's all just garbage. I know. I mean, there's my 
I come from a family of scientists. My dad's a scientist. My brother's a doctor. My sister-in-law is a doctor. They are very knowledgeable about nutrition because they've chosen to learn about it past, you know, my brother didn't get a lot of nutrition training in medical school. And he'll be the first to tell you that, you know, he feeds raw, (laughs) believes in raw. Like I always tell the story about recently he went to um, his vet um, for his German shepherd, just for a regular checkup. And um, it was during the kind of the height of the DCM scandal, which I'm sure you're, you know, the, no, I okay, don't so, know what that is. So DCM is a big, it's a, an acronym for dilated cardiomyopathy, which is genetically, it can affect uh, certain breeds like Dobermans are prone to it a lot more. But what happened was not to get too into the weeds with this, but there was a big sort of, um, it, it, there's not now a lawsuit against them, but DCM was sort of spread by a few vets that, um, we're collecting data to try to prove that it was caused by grain-free diets. So they said, you know, anything, BEG diet, so b- boutique exotic grain-free, so mm-hmm. raw, anything that wasn't coming from these bigger companies. And they, these vets, um, one of them was at Tufts, uh, sort of directed uh, other vets to report any cases of DCM only with dogs that were eating BEG diets. <laughs> Already you have like a flawed study, like you're – what about the dogs that are eating kibble that might have had DCM? So um, it just the FDA made this announcement a few years ago that was like, we are looking into a connection between DCM and grain-free diet. So it just created this entire like crazy shit storm across the pet owning community. People were freaking out like, oh my gosh, I'm feeding grain-free. Like, what does this mean? Like my dog's going to die. Um, sure. And, and so naturally sure. grain-free diets, like raw diets were sort of lumped in there, but Turns out it was a total uh, just sham, basically, and there was no evidence, no real evidence, and there's now a lawsuit against Hills um, for sort of propagating this crazy um, information. But my brother at the time went into his vet, and the vet was like, what's your dog eating? He said, a raw diet. His dog has been eating uh, our diet for his whole life. And he said, oh, you should just start feeding, adding some rice to that diet. And my brother was like, why? And he's like, oh, there's studies coming out that are showing that, um, you know, no, diets with no grain are causing DCM. So my brother, being a doctor and, you know, used to reading clinical research, was like, can you send me that study? Well, the, the vet went to go do something else. So he sent him the link. My brother read it on his phone when he was sitting there, and there was nothing in there that said anything about that. And so he said to the vet when he came back in the room, like, there's no information in here about that. And the vet said, oh, I didn't read the whole study. I just read the, sure. the headlines. The headlines. It's like, but you're telling people that it's still, scary. though? Like, we deal with that every crazy. day. Like, so it's really, and I feel like that's a bad story about vets and not all vets are like that. But it just shows you, like, that just happened to my brother, too. Like, think about how much that's being spread. So there's just so much um, misinformation and bad information out there. Um, I think yeah. you have to be careful. Yeah. Yeah, I have. I have immediate close family members who are vets and Mm -hmm. they're the best at what they do yeah and they are amazing but they they know their lane and they're like hey i'm not that and i you know so it's we see like i said we see it all the time with people going to vets and the vets so some that's the thing like you and i have already talked about this several times about being transparent about vets are amazing if our dog's sick we need vets yeah um you know, God forbid they hit by a car, like mm-hmm. they're our best friends, but it's just for the general public. That's why podcasts are so important that understanding that just because somebody is a vet, they're not a trainer mm-hmm. just because they work with dogs every day. They're not a nutritionist just because you go to same thing with behaviorists. Like I always tell people, I have friends that are behaviorists. I have uh, colleagues that are behaviorists. I work with them. We share ideas back and forth. Mm-hmm. It's a very respectful, mutual thing. But there's some behaviorist I, I, dog owners are misled down a road of what behaviorists are are supposed to do. So they think we have a behaviorist with a PhD. My dog has a behavioral problem. The vet says go to the behaviorist. So it's this chain of command, right? So the vet says I'm not a train. Some vets will go I'm not a trainer. Go to the behaviorist. Mm-hmm. They go to the behaviorist because their dog is aggressive or reactive. The behaviorist job again historically is to diagnose what's going on with the dog. So anxiety, fear, aggression, very rarely. I think I've had one behaviorist since I've been doing this because I get the, so then I'm, so then the trainer is usually the next step Mm -hmm. because that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Every time they cut, so it goes down the line, bing, bing, bing. And it's just, it's evidence. Mm -hmm. 
It's boots on the ground, real evidence. Yeah. It's not a piece of paper. It's right. this is most of our clients Amazon. go down this line. Yeah. Yeah. If we we have we have 4K documentation of our clients when they come in, how they come in, what they're dealing with and what they did and what the result is after working with a trainer. Been documented for a decade. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? So typically it's the the behavior is, so it's not the behavior's fault. It's the education of the dog owner understanding do not go to the vet for dog training advice because that's if your dog breaks their leg go to the vet. Do not go to the behaviorist expecting dog training advice. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you can't go to the behaviorist where it's mm -hmm. bad or they're not useful, but the behaviorist's job historically is to diagnose mm -hmm. what behavior your dog is doing and presenting. And nine times out of 10, they're not going to touch your dog. Mm -hmm. They're not going to pick up the leash. Mm -hmm. They're going to stand back. They're going to take notes. They're going to observe. Not every behaviorist, mm -hmm. but majority of behaviorists out there, that's mm -hmm. their job. It's not bad. Yeah. It's not they're doing anything wrong. It's not that they're being fraudulent. That's, yeah. That's their job. Yeah. Dog owners don't understand that a behaviorist with a PhD's job is to diagnose what's going on with their dog. Yeah. Most behaviorists that I've worked with and have talked to will then refer you to a trainer to say, you need to go to a trainer to get results. Yeah. Here's maybe some medication in between. So I think there's just this lapse of information of understanding everyone's lane. Yeah. Of like no. what they're supposed to do. Yeah, that's a really good point because I don't think I would have known necessarily before. Because when I got, we've talked about this, but my rescue uh, came to us with a lot of <laughs> issues. Very leash react. I mean, seventy five mm -hmm. pounds. We live in downtown Charleston. There's dogs and people everywhere. I was like, the first time I walked him, I was like, basically in tears. <laughs> sure. I'm like, what have we done? Um, you know, I took him to the vet for just a normal. Uh, check up and you know they were telling me well their their solution was we should try to put them on Prozac I'm like that just didn't feel right to me like but no talk about like training so then of course my husband and I did all sorts of other research and we did end up doing training and it was the best thing we did for him yeah. he's happy now we're happy he can walk he's not freaking out like yeah. he's a, a happy healthy dog you know um that's but, the system yeah yeah that's that's how that works yeah and and I and I zoom out as a dog lover slash professional and I just say, like, this is the system that dog owners get put into. This is the filtration process. The first person that a dog owner is like, their dog goes and bites the neighbor or whatever. They go to the vet because they're like, I don't know what else to do. Yeah. That's yes. just what happens. And then the vet says, sometimes they refer a local trainer or whatever, mm -hmm. or they'll say, go to a behaviorist. The behaviorist will sit back, observe, send videos. Let me see. Come back next week. We'll see again. Here's some medication. Do things get better? And a lot of times the behaviorist just gives them so much medication to put them in. We had a dog in here this week. We worked with my, my colleague, Dr. Cotty, who is, has a PhD in animal welfare. Mm -hmm. She told the owner, she's like, your dog should not even be able to walk with the amount of oh, medication your dog is on. Yeah. Right. So that's that, but that's their, that's their job mm -hmm. is to diagnose and to medicate. They're yeah. not trainers. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, and when I say that, some people are offended, like, oh, they have a PH. I'm like, yeah, but, yeah, but they're not trainers. Right, right, right. Their job is to diagnose right. what's going on. Right. And to give you a roadmap. And their roadmap is to not pick up the leash right. and find the problem or the root of the problem or even analyze your relationship yep. with your dog clinically. Right. It's to say, your dog has separation anxiety. I'm going to write you a prescription. Just like if you go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. You go, hey, I got... I got a, a sore throat yeah. or I got uh, whatever. Yeah. They're, they're not, they're going to prescribe you something, yeah. which is not good or bad. I'm just saying like, that's their job. Maybe it's needed sometimes, but like it's, they don't look, if you, yeah, I know. So that's the, the system dog owners get put into yeah. and it's it, no fall other than education. Just yeah. understanding that that's their roles. Right. And a dog trainer is supposed to then, like when somebody comes to me with a problem, I am what, I, what, what we call in our industry an unlimited dog trainer, which means if you're a limited dog trainer, you have limits to your methodology, the tools that you use, your ideology that you present to the client, and the experiences, right? So that's limited. You're limited. So if you say, I'm only going to use this type of training, or I'm only going to use this type of training tool, you're limited. And that means that why are all these other methods and training tools out there? It's not because well, I don't believe in them and they don't work. Well, of course, why, why can you say that they don't work or you don't believe in them when there's millions of other people who are finding success with them and, mm -hmm. and having really good experiences with them? Mm -hmm. So it's limited. You're limiting, yes. right? And then an unlimited dog trainer and historically past, it would be a balanced approach, 
or balanced doesn't make sense to dog owners. So we have start calling it unlimited. I have an unlimited ability Mm -hmm. because my toolbox is unlimited. Mm -hmm. If your dog comes in, I had four dogs. I like that. Yeah, is, is that a new? I thought it was still called balanced. It is oh. <laughs> to the general public. Okay. My friend Forrest Mickey coined yeah. this. I like it. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and I can't take credit for it, but I'm trying to make it popular yeah. where that's reality of what we do, right? So yeah. I just had four dogs come in from all over, different countries, different states, and they all had different problems, and they were all different owners, they were all different ages, they were all different breeds. Mm-hmm. Some of them have been abused. Mm-hmm. Some of them were not. Some of them wanted to go off leash. Some of them wanted to stop reacting. Some of them wanted to get more confidence. Mm-hmm. I am unlimited to my ideology of like how I feel right. is going on, right? So my experiences, there, there's no roadblocks for me. Right. The moment you start putting roadblocks and ceilings on dog training is the moment that your clients can't progress mm-hmm. because of your ceiling. Mm-hmm. And I'm not the one to say that's good or bad. It's just knowing from, again, a dog owner is going to go into a certain trainer and they may be limited. Mm -hmm. So we see that often too, where you go to same, same exact principle, right? That same series, you go to a vet, they're limited in dog training because they don't do dog training. You go to behaviors, they're limited in dog training because they don't do dog training, right? Then you go to a trainer and it splits like this. You either go to a limited dog trainer who has, they're only comfortable, experienced, knowledgeable, educated in using one particular methodology Mm -hmm. or one particular sequence in the four quadrants of how animals learn Mm -hmm. and or they're limited in the tools that they're using. It's not bad. It's not wrong. It's not, it's not that anybody's better than that. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is we have to look at it objectively and say that's limited. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's not this <laughs> crazy aspect of, well, everything else outside of this is wrong and it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. When there's millions of people that are successful with tools that don't follow what it reality is, is your ideology. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So more yeah. people are interested in protecting their ideology because it becomes naturally their whole personality, mm-hmm. becomes their image. It becomes who they are. Right. They put it in their Instagram bio. I am this. Mm-hmm. Like I'm a kibble feeder. Yeah. Like what do you, your virtual signaling actually your ideology, yeah. not about what you actually believe in. Mm-hmm. Because if something works that's against your ideology, that is your whole being, mm-hmm. your reflection of who you are, mm-hmm. it's devastating. Mm-hmm. Somebody says, this slip leash or this raw food will never have an impact in a better way Mm -hmm. with your dog ever. Mm -hmm. 10 people over here go and try a slip leash and raw food and it 1000% the better relationship, the nutrition, the benefits of the dog. Mm -hmm. To that person, they have nothing else to say except poo poo it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same sequence that we see from vets to behaviors to trainers with nutrition in the same sequence, right? that we see in dog training. Mm -hmm. And my goal has always been as a dog lover first is to not expose, but to talk and have a conversation about the realities. Mm -hmm. Because if I was a dog lover as much as I am now, and I wasn't gifted this gift from God of working with dogs and having the skill sets that I have, if I went to somebody and said, hey, I wanna train my dog who's reactive, and they said, these are the things we're going to use and it didn't work. I have three options. Deal with it, cry every day, walk my dog at night, hide behind cars, have a stressful relationship with my dog with my dog mm-hmm. and my dog suffers for the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. Kill my dog. Bring my dog to the shelter. Mm-hmm. When they go to the shelter, then they have two options. They go with somebody else, same sequence, mm-hmm. or they get killed anyway. Yeah. And if I was in that situation, I would be, it would crush me. Yeah. So that's why I talk about the opportunities for dog owners to do different things. Yeah. And the dogs that came in here this month and this week, they all, you know, they, they all have different things. And so because I'm unlimited, 
I, I don't have any hesitation or filter system. So it's the same thing with like dog owners where you go in and you say, hey, my dog's overweight. My dog has these fatty tumors. My dog's arthritic. My dog has, my dog's lethargic. And they're like, well, why don't you try adding rice to your diet? Mm -hmm. Because they, so the dog owner's like, well, you're, you're the doctor. So, and then things get worse. Yeah. So we, so it's, I'm just happy to have this conversation with you because, you know, you, there's a, there's more people in the dog training space that are unlimited or balanced than there are not. Mm -hmm. The people who are not are just the loudest. Yeah. It's more people walk around with dog training equipment that helps them and benefits them than not. Mm -hmm. But in your space, you're pioneering and you're going against the grain because it's newer. Like the dog training space has been evolving for a long time yeah. where you're pioneering this whole new thing. Well, we're, yeah, we're disrupting a space in a way. And I think like it's, it is hard to deal with. I mean, I, I go back and forth too. And I'll, I'll be honest, it's hard to, I, we don't want to be elitist and we don't want to say, oh, if you can't feed raw, then, you know, I, we understand it's more expensive, all of those things. But like, we just can't, like saying something like kibble is a convenience food, not a health food is not an insult. It's a fact. And, and guess yeah. what? Like if we thought kibble were a good option, this company wouldn't be here. It's here because right. we don't. So like we're a raw dog food company working very hard to provide a really awesome product. So we're not going to shy away from educating people about the dangers and pitfalls of what 95% of dogs are eating. Right. You know, like that's just part of it. Um, and again, we don't want to be uh, shaming you if you do feed kibble too. We have, if you do just go to our Instagram, it's like, I would say what 75% of the posts are people mixing it with kibble, right? Like kibble yeah. isn't going to kill your dog um, if you're, you know, or make your dog sick if you're feeding it too. But if you're feeding it only, like that's where it starts to become a problem. Like only feeding ultra processed food day after day for an entire lifetime, you're going to see problems. Excuse me, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's kind of, uh, and I, I, I totally agree with you about the ideology. And I think that you probably see this too in your industry, but it's gotten a little different for us now, but when we first were doing it, it was like smaller. The people that were come to us were kind of out of a, in a place of desperation. They had yeah. tried everything else, and this was like so they were more open minded. Um, but now that we're yeah. growing, it was a, almost an easier customer in that sense because they're like the vet's like we don't can't help you anymore. So it's like then they find this right, yeah, um, and they're willing to try and they're willing to be open to it. But when you start to get a more mainstream customer, they're already they're a lot more hesitant. Maybe there's nothing wrong with the dog yet, and they just. A mainstream audience. Yeah. Yeah. But it's good. We want to be there, but it's just, it's different. You know, it's like, um, that's right. Having to, can, you could be feeding kibble and our nutritionist says to, you know, the wrong diet can appear to work for many years. <laughs> I just laughing in my head. Cause I'm thinking about the things that I do for myself that other people would be like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> like I, dr I wake up in the morning and crack open. There's like this Quentin called Quentin. Uh, and what it is, is it's like this al it's, it's made from this algae from seawater from okay. this, the depths of this specific part of the ocean in the world okay. and it helps your electrolytes get into your system a lot faster so you become more hydrated and you okay. feel great mm -hmm. so in the morning it's in a glass vial yeah. and i crack one it's like this weird thing we'll put it up on the screen yeah. for people who are watching this on youtube you crack one end open you put it up you have to crack the other and it's glass yeah. and then you suck it down then i go into a cold plunge that's 34 degrees that i have to smash ice out of to get in <laughs> and after that i go into the sauna that's about 170 degrees for half an hour mm -hmm. and it sucks yeah. so the, the, my point is is it has I used to have a lot of anxiety like to a point where I didn't want to do anything mm -hmm. I've had depression mm -hmm. I have the most beautiful life that anybody could ever imagine and I've worked really hard for it but sometimes because of my genetics and or the amount of caffeine that I no longer drink because now <laughs> I, you know yeah. um, so my point is is I'm doing things that other people would be like you're nuts. Yeah. Why would you do that? Extreme, right? I have found I had to go, I had to break the system to do things that were not necessarily protocol yeah. and out of the normal mm -hmm. to better my life. Yeah. And it's drastically changed every aspect of what I do. Even having this conversation now, being a father, being a husband, being an educator, being a boss, uh, being being a human, it's bettered my life. Like it's taken away anxiety. It's taken away depression. Just get, getting into the cold yeah. that 
90% of people, maybe more, would be my family. Like, you're nuts. What are you doing? It's snowing outside and I'm getting into the cold. Yeah. So it's the same thing with dog training. It's the same thing with feeding your dogs is there's going to be people, there's going to be outliers that are like, this isn't fucking working. Yeah. What do I do? Yeah. Yeah. And they find something that works. I don't want to take SSRs yeah. or SSIRs. Or, SSRIs. Yeah, SSRIs. Yeah. I don't want to... Um, I, there's there's alternative things that you can do that are natural, mm-hmm. right? And, and and talking about natural, like feeding a dog raw food is as natural as it could possibly be for the carnivores and savages that they are <laughs> because they'll go and kill a rabbit and yeah. eat the thing after. Yeah. Like even with cats, my cat eats raw food. Yeah. Well, cats are obligate carnivores, so they really... He, this cat, dude, uh, he, <laughs> he kills more. There's like a statistic out there that cats kill like 10 billion rodents They're a year. Great predators. Crazy. Way better predators than dogs. He'll eat a whole, like he'll kill a chipmunk and then eat the whole thing without thinking. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, it's like crazy <laughs> yeah. to see, but it's the most, na- it's the same thing with dog training, yeah. right? Like me, like for an example, like some people, it's so funny. They, 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 they don't, every single industry has different politics and you can ask anybody, no matter what what industry they're in what's the what's the politics in your industry and they would be like oh like if they're a plumber they're going to be like some people don't believe in this type of putty to, to, yeah, yeah. and the other side they're like no we don't do putty we do this gel and it's yeah. like and you're like really yeah. and that's what all they think about right and with you it may be like kibble versus raw food and with me it'd be like limited versus unlimited mm-hmm. right and when we come down to natural dog training natural dog nutrition it's i want to be as pure as i possibly can mm-hmm. so correcting a dog for behavior that's yeah. ultimately either going to kill them or have them suffer for the rest of their life through stress and anxiety right so there's these things that we can do in the beginning of a dog's life feeding your dog raw food in the beginning could and possibly likely will be proactive to potential diseases and cancers in the future right so correcting my dog early on so they have boundaries and understand where they are in life within my life with my dogs and my kids and my universe is going to help them become a really balanced, healthy, mentally and physically dog down the future so I don't need training. Mm-hmm. So I'm proactive instead of reactive, yeah. which is a lot of my clients don't. Yeah. A lot of your clients probably don't either. Right. They wait for a problem and they need a solution, yeah. which because, is yeah. which is huge, that. right? So so it's all it it's objective to and that's what you and I are doing. We're like, "Hey, if you don't feed kibble, we're still going to go out and have a beer. Like, yeah. we don't care. Yeah. If you use a harness versus uh, a slip collar, yeah. it's okay. Like, yeah. nobody cares. Right. Our jobs and our passion, from what it seems, is we're just giving other people an alternative. Mm-hmm. Of saying, like, hey, if you want, like, you want to, like, I'm at a place now where I'm so grateful. I was homeless, and I ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and I drove a car that couldn't go on the north way to get to my clients because it would fall apart and be dangerous. Mm-hmm. Now I'm at a point in my career where I can pay my bills on time, which I've never been able to do, mm-hmm. and I can afford things like n- nutrients, mm-hmm. naturopathic doctors, yeah. cold plunges. Like that's I'm really grateful for that, mm-hmm. right? But that's what this whole podcast is about. That's what having you on is about is just teaching people, okay, like, hey, we're not like you, yeah. like you said, like when we post – Raw food is great. Yeah. People are like, well, what does that mean for him? Nothing. Yeah. yeah. It's just if you want to explore. Right. Here's the here's the information. Here's the information. And you don't have to uh, feel bad about yourself. Like it's really guilt is a useless emotion. We're not trying to make people feel guilty. Right. That's not going to help us as a business either. We don't want you to feel shame. We want you to feel inspired to yeah. look into it further. Do the best that you can. And we really say that all the time, the best that you can within your budget and lifestyle. Yeah. Some people travel a lot on the weekends. They can't always take the raw food with them. They're feeding mm-hmm. kibble on the weekends. That's fine. It's just g- getting to a better place. And even adding like 10% fresh raw food or just any other fresh food is going to make a difference. And they've done studies and they've seen um, that just that small amount is going to help your dog so much. So I think... We're still going to put it out there. We're still going to, I don't want to say bash kibble, but it's hard not to, right? Like it is, it's an ultra processed food. Like I guess it it serves a purpose. Like what are the great things about kibble? It's really convenient and it's really cost effective. Those are two really big pluses. Uh, We're never going to say it's a healthy food, that it's, it it sustains life, right? It's what do they always say? It's it's adequate nutrition, whatever that means. But um, yeah, but you're going to get your clients, right? Like you're going to get, that's the same thing with health and wellness. Like you go to a yoga class. You're gonna you're gonna ask those people what they had for lunch. Like you've ever seen, I don't know if you've ever seen these, but they have like the TikToks or they have the Instagram reels, and they'll go into a uh, a physician's like they'll do like a surgical center's lunch, and they 
doctor uh, x doctor doctor yeah. doctor doctor and they're all eating like greens and grass-fed beef and and chicken and they all have these like high protein slash greens fresh vegetables yeah. fresh veggies yeah. like so my point is is like you're going to cultivate the community that like if you're gonna like if i'm gonna start a podcast on how to better your relationship with a dog i'm gonna get a bunch of people that are gonna be watching listening tuning in to how to do that mm-hmm. People who don't agree with it are going to go elsewhere. Fine, you're going to create a dog food company that's going to better better the nutrition and, and lifestyle and longevity of a dog. You're going to get a bunch of people that are going to tune into that and figure that out. So I, I think it's really just understanding that this world is such a big place, and each breath, and and each day is 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 should never be taken for granted. And what you and I are trying to do is sit down and create companies that are going to better the things that we care about the most, which are dogs. Mm-hmm. And we're, it's we, life's too short to argue about who's right and who's wrong. You're going to say, and these are my experiences. These are the results. Yeah. It's facts. A hundred percent. These things work. You can either do it or you can not, yeah. but it doesn't matter. Yeah. What are things that people at home can do if they can't afford? Because uh, that's a thing that, again, yeah. we talked about. Maybe you can't go, like I feed, we feed raw every meal, yeah. you know, now for two dogs. Um if you can't go full raw, mm-hmm. like what are things that people can do at home? Yeah. Not necessarily even with We Feed Raw, but yeah. like you said, blueberries, yeah. strawberries, yeah. crack an egg on the thing. Like yeah. what are things, because you see it because you have uh, other influencers that yeah. you work with and other yeah. creators that you work with and you, you you guys put out content on how to do this. Tell people like what they can do at home if maybe they can't afford full raw, but maybe a quarter raw. Yeah. So we have, like always, there's a good, better, best, right? Um, and I think that, even with our food, so we'll start with our food, you don't have to feed it for every meal. You can have flexible subscriptions, they're called. So you can postpone your order. You can, you know, if you have too much, you can, you know, hold it and then, you know, start reordering again in six weeks, like to make it so that you're feeding every other meal or even a few meals a week or using it as a topper. Um, We really try to make that easy for people. Um, And especially like sometimes people will buy one box and split it between their two dogs, you know, Mm -hmm. so they're not getting 100% food, but they're just, and it becomes more affordable that way. Um, If you're not going to feed our food, there's so many other real foods that you can, I mean, there's really, it's endless, like anything really that we can eat besides those few things that we talked about. And we can maybe list those, like, I don't know, in your show notes or something Mm -hmm. about the, but, um, you know, blueberries, any kind of berries are also great. Um, You know, even leftover uh, veggies from from your dinner, um, leftover meat that you've cooked. And there's like just basically the table scraps too. We're going back to that, you know, adding it to the top of their kibble bowls, bone broth, um, goat's milk. Um, I mean, just any fresh nutrient dense whole foods that you can get into that bowl. Don't be afraid to add those. It, it will make a difference. So I think it's just getting over Like, again, people are scared. They're like, but can I, can I really add like just mm-hmm. this? You're like, yeah, it's fine. It's totally fine. Um, just try to think of your <laughs> dog as like a living being that would thrive off of nutrient dense foods the same way that you would. Right. Um, it doesn't have to be raw. Um, obviously we think raw is the most digestible. It's the most bioavailable, um, but you can feed gently cooked. You can feed, um, just get away, get as far away from the ultra processed food as possible. If that's still making up a huge portion of your dog's diet, think about yeah. what you can do to add nutrient dense whole foods on top of that. It's the same thing with my son. Yeah. He's a year and a half. Yeah. And people are like, what does he eat? I'm like, same thing we eat. Yeah. That's good. You're still in the young. See, mine's six and yeah. it's getting harder. I used to, I'm like, I remember I could just give you avocado. You yeah. wouldn't fight back. And now it's yeah. like anything green is like, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, you struggle, but it's like, do the best you can. I still try to give him healthy things. It's still way too many carbs than I would like. Yeah. Right. But, um, I'm constantly thinking about that. It's on my mind. I don't just like, you know, give him. Uh, yeah. Process packaged foods. Yeah, no. Everything. Yeah, and we we travel so much, and it's been. I think just our whole team, you know, Abby included, like, you know, she has a specific diet and like, you know, my wife and I eat very clean. Like, again, we go out and do, we, we all of our protein comes from a farm that's less than a hundred miles from our house. That's awesome. All of our vegetables, we try to get locally. We'll go to the farmer's market. You know, everything that we do, we try to eat clean. And it's not because again, we're like this elitist. It's just like, I care. I'm at a position where I can afford to put my nutrition and health first. Right. And that's amazing. And I'm grateful for that. Right. But I've also worked really hard to do that. I understand not everybody can do that, but if you can go out and just 
add carrots to your dog's food, broccoli to your dog's food. And, and like Amy was saying, you could get, uh, like, if you're not comfortable with going, you know, complete raw turkey or raw chicken or raw beef, lightly cooked, like get yeah. some, like you can, like even going to a place that sells low end quality beef, you know, in the big tubes is going to be better for your dog than highly processed kibble that the minerals and nutrition vitamins were imported from China. And well, and also it's this so many starches and also the yes. meat that is in there. We talked yes. about it. So just adding these things, so you don't have to get a subscription to We Feed Raw to start a better diet. And I know that your goal and your passion is to help other people. Like my goal is like 90 per, 95% of people that listen and consume my content aren't going to necessarily be my clients. Mm -hmm. But I'm still pumping out information because you care and I care about dogs. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Like 90% of these people aren't going to sign up for a subscription of We Feed Raw. Although also, that'd be great. But <laughs> the reality is, is it's education. And that's what I care about the most. But we do have bills to pay. So, yeah, we have courses. You have We Feed Raw. Mm -hmm. You have treats. You yeah. have these things. We yeah. have bills to pay. Yeah. So it's important, guys, like when we're talking about this, we're not trying to fear monger you into you have to throw out your kibble right now. And in fact, my puppy is still on pre-arena puppy chow mm -hmm. because he's transitioning to raw. Mm -hmm. So I'm putting his, you know, even my yeah. wife was like, oh, it smells awful. <laughs> she hasn't even, I don't even think she's ever smelled kibble because yeah. we've been on raw for yeah. so long. Yeah, I know. Don't come at us, pre-arena. Yeah, um, yeah, right. No, I know. It's true. And I think we're, we're, we try not to be too severe. And I think it's just, it, it, it sounds more like fear mongering when you talk about the facts about ultra processed pet food because it's shocking Yes. Stuff, right? Like it's shocking. Yeah. So it can seem like we're, but it's, these are the facts. Is Pet Fooled still on Netflix? I think it's on Amazon Prime. Now. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, There's a documentary called Pet Fooled. Mm -hmm. It's on uh, Amazon Prime. It used to be on Netflix. It might that be you, on YouTube too. Yeah, you guys can check out. Basically, this guy went in. I haven't watched the whole thing. Yeah. Because I'm, I know about it, but yeah. he went in and did a, like, and a documentary on pet food. Mm -hmm. And that was really, that really opened up a lot of people's eyes. But yeah. would you be surprised if Purina approached you guys in five years and said, hey, we want to buy your company? Because they're going to they're gonna have to get into it because it's the same thing with everything else. Like health in America, regardless, uh, yeah, there's, they're going to be, but health in America, wellness in America is growing so much because yeah. of conversations like you and I are having. Yeah. Podcasting and creators and influencers are making mm -hmm. such a big difference on real conversations. We're not seeing the Coca-Cola commercials yeah. anymore, right? Because TV isn't such a big yeah. thing. Every ad that we consumed yeah. when I was growing up, when you were growing up, yeah. it was, was big, big companies, right? Coca-Cola, McDonald's, all the fun toys and the fun looking food yeah. and it's all bullshit yeah, right yeah. now people are consuming real people like you and I about like hey I'm doing this instead and I feed my dog this instead so I think the wellness and health in America is go gonna go up because there's real people having real conversations about what is actually good mm -hmm. and they're not being shoved with commercials on the four shows that's on a night and it's the only thing you see yeah. and it's the only fast food that's out there. Now we have yoga studios everywhere. We have uh, smoothie shops everywhere. We have uh, acai bowls everywhere. Like mm -hmm. it's becoming more and more. Do you feel like these big companies inevitably are going to get into the raw food just because May they have to? I just don't know if the margins are there for them. I don't think it's like as attractive. I think that kibble mm. will always exist. Kibble's not going anywhere. Kibble right. will yeah, always be an option, right? It's always going to be like McDonald's. Think, yeah, and I think there's a space for. I mean, there will always be a space for both. Has you to know, be. Um, I don't know if the cable companies maybe they'll start to. I have seen some things where they're starting to get into the fresh food, not raw is a little bit extreme, but the fresh food yeah. space um, and have their own versions of that. Um, that's a good thing. You'll just always want to pay attention to the sourcing and uh, the way they're being processed because, again, it's all about kind of like. How do you make the most money for, right. you know, sure. I, I don't think any raw company, at least today, um, started because of that. It's just not the quickest way to get rich. Right. It never will be. It's just not like that. So maybe, yeah, they'll start to get more into the fresh food. There's some, I think Nom Nom Now was bought for like a billion dollars by one of the big pet food companies. Um, that's incredible. A billion dollars. I haven't even heard of that company. Yeah, so that's. Yeah. I know. That, I think that was like two years ago now they were bought or a year and a half ago. Uh, gently cooked. Um, and then I think there's another one that just came out with a fresh, gently cooked uh, brand. So yeah, I mean, you're right. That's definitely something that they're paying attention they have to. to. The consumers are driving the trend, right? Consumers are saying we want better for our dogs. They're going into their vets and saying it. Um, 
So yeah, yeah. vets are probably like, because that's always the thing. Again, our clients, yeah. you know, we have a certain niche group of people who are trying to find out information, the better relationship with their dog with the results. And we see that all the time where they come in, they say, hey, like my vet said this. And yeah. we always give them like the information and yeah. it's interesting. So yeah, we have a sheet. I, th- I told you we have a sheet where just like here to like hear all the talking points because we yeah. know what they're going to say. We know what the concerns are. Um, one of the clients that we have that we work with who is a conventional vet, uh, she's amazing. Uh, she feeds her dogs this food and it's an interesting journey because that she talks about because she had her dogs on kibble. Um, they were suffering from IBD, all sorts of <laughs> sicknesses. She had them in like agility training on the weekends and she would go to these, you know, agility training sessions and all of the dogs are like amazing athletes, like doing you know so well and she started inquiring and all the owners were like they're on raw mm-hmm. diets right so she switched her dogs to raw to our raw mm-hmm. and they all of those the ibd went away all the other yeah. things and they're thriving so that's what i'm saying is like once so there's a difference between like a like a real dog professional or uh, a, a dog enthusiast versus a dog lover yeah so most people are dog lovers yeah they love dogs but yeah. they're they don't know enough to really get into like what's good for their dog yeah do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like if you go into a lot of, again, like, like we have a PSA group here, uh, a lot of sports clubs, like they have, so if you go into like, uh, again, like an agility ring or a dock diving ring, or even the fly ball things that are getting very popular or a protection ring, not all, but a lot of them are on very specific equipment. They go through very specific training. They yeah. go through very specific nutrition. You're like, how are you guys all like this? And it's yeah. like, because they have done their research. They're not following that normal path, yeah. right? They're outliers. They're unlimited. Limited. They're not limited, mm-hmm. right? And that's what we're starting to see is people who are actually like, you know what? I think this is bullshit. Mm-hmm. Like this isn't working. Yeah, yeah. Like this person doesn't make sense. This isn't working. Yeah, yeah the studies say that, but this isn't working. Like yeah. I don't understand. Then they start to find other alternatives and then they get into these communities that's why there's these big facebook groups of everyone's like all on the same page and you see all these really well why are all these dogs really well trained it's because they all do a certain why are all these dogs super healthy it's because they all feed this specific diet that's becoming more and more you're going to get into these communities where you're going to get a good result and they're all under this they've all kind of like went outlierish yeah you know and word that's, mouth, I've seen it, word of mouth is huge. Yeah, it's so huge. Do you guys mind if I take a bathroom break? Well, let's just, okay. I think yeah. we'll just wrap it up oh, okay. here. Um, if you want to, <laughs> if you want to tell people like where they can find you and um, that yeah. sort of thing. And yeah, so we are, wefeedraw.com. Uh, all of our socials are just wefeedraw. Um, we're direct to consumer only. So we're not in retail stores. So we, you know, make all of the meals and ship them directly to your doorstep. Free shipping. Um, we have six different recipes, chicken, beef, duck, lamb, venison, turkey, did I say? <laughs> I think I said You didn't say turkey, but you just turkey. did. Okay, yeah, so yeah. six. Um, yeah, so you can, you know, we always tell people feed the most, the most for, more variety, the better. I think you're just feeding the red meat ones, right? Yeah. Do you feed, yeah. yeah, I just do duck and, well, I'll do, do chicken do? too, but I'll do duck and beef right now. Oh, duck is good. So you have the poultry in there too. Yeah. yeah. Um, cause it just helps the full spectrum of amino acids when you do yeah. more, um, different proteins. Like they're all, some people like I have a, one of our employees just feeds Turkey. Um, I don't know, but she, her dog only did well on Turkey when she was feeding kibble. Sure. So she just st- still complete and balanced, but it's better if you can feed at least three. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's what we do. Yeah. So I'll yeah. leave all the, all the information in the show notes as okay. well as my discount code. Okay. But yeah, we feed raw. You guys can go online, pin in your dog's information, put in their activity levels, their age, their breed, and they will ship you directly to your door. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and yes, we're partners, but we're partners because I believe in the company and yeah. that's why we're talking today. Exactly. Thanks, Amy. It's been great. Thank you. Now you can go to the bathroom. I got to pee too. So <laughs> thanks guys. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Bye. Bye.